My girlfriend and I moved into a new apartment roughly three years ago. She has since then been suffering from weekly sleep paralysis. Her brother used to have them when they were children, so she knew what they were right away. She has described it as being completely paralyzed, besides breathing and moving her eyes. And most of the time she sees that dark, tall figure moving around our apartment when they happen. Sometimes she just hears him walking, sometimes he's staring at her from the door, and sometimes he presses down on her chest, making it difficult for her to breathe. She is a non-believer of the paranormal, and yet this sleep paralysis terrifies her. So now to the really scary part. So she usually manages to wake me up during these by breathing quickly and loudly. I can then wake her from it, which enables her to move again and the figure disappears. What I haven't told her though is that these past two months, I have actually seen the figure as well. Right after I'm woken up by her breathing, I can see it bent over, bent over her that is, pushing down on her ribcage. It always disappears the second that I acknowledge it or try to wake her. I've also seen it standing in the hallway staring at me one night while I was home alone watching a movie. I pretended that I didn't see it and it had disappeared the next time that I looked over. Now to the dilemma. So, do I tell my girlfriend that her sleep paralysis demon might not be a regular sleep paralysis demon after all, since I've seen it too, and also at the same time as her, waking her up from the paralysis at night that is. I guess I don't want to scare her. I mean, she's already terrified from the sleep paralysis itself, and that is when she feels certain that it's just in her own head. We can't afford to move either, and I think we can both live like this, given that I never tell her the truth that is. So, what's your advice? Should I tell her, or should I just let it be? This is the story of the scariest moment of my life. It's been a few months since I experienced this sighting, but I'm still pretty terrified to go out at night due to seeing what I saw. So about three months ago, I had moved on to an 11 acre property in rural Texas, specifically between Yorktown and Smiley. The entire plot of land was about maybe three to four times the size of the lot that we purchased but nobody had purchased any of the other portions while we were there. The land was fresh, never had been built on before, and didn't even have an address. It was surrounded solely by oil pumps on neighboring properties. At night, you could actually see the burning off from them lighting part of the sky orange. Our house was a bare-bones tiny house. No walls, just wooden beams and a bare floor. No running water, no plumbing... We had to dig the electric from the pole all the way to the house ourselves. And that's how the new property was. It was a, a miserable experience all around, but we were poor and it was really the only living situation that we could find. Now, I've never been a believer in the paranormal. I still don't really believe in things like ghosts or demons. I'm a sort of, if I see it, I'll believe it person. After this experience, though... I am definitely more open to these types of things. What I saw I just call the creature. Creative, I know. When I moved onto the property, there were some weird anomalies in technology that started to happen. Phones would glitch out and stop working, the cameras would act strange and parked cars that were turned off would suddenly chime and lights would turn on. I always thought that it was odd, but I never connected it to the property until my girlfriend mentioned the strange happenings later on after my sighting. One night, soon after I moved there, I had to get something out of my car and I took my phone light, walked out, opened the door, and started digging around in the glove box with my full focus on finding what I was looking for. I forgot exactly what it was that I was searching for in the end. After looking for a while and not finding it, I closed the door and shone my light back towards the house. There was a truck parked between me and the door to the house and as I shone my light towards the truck, I became instantly terrified because what I saw was a tall, 
I would guess seven to eight foot, humanoid creature with white, sort of sickly looking skin. Its arms and legs looked longer than a human's, and as I shone my light in that direction, it instantly ran off. It had the capability to leap over the truck, mind you, landing in the bed momentarily before hopping over the other edge and disappearing beyond my sight. I distinctly remember how the truck shook when it nimbly jumped over it. The time that it took to do that was about four to five seconds. I never did get to see its face and to be honest I'm glad that I didn't as I would probably be even more traumatized than I already am. I can only imagine what its face looked like. Would it have reflective eyes like an animal? I still wonder about that. Instead of stepping in the car and locking the door, I quickly walked around the truck and into the house, like an idiot, I know, but I was really terrified though when I stepped around the truck that it would be waiting there for me. Luckily it wasn't, but for the rest of the night I was absolutely horrified, as well as the rest of the time that I lived there, which was only about a month. I would have thought, okay, maybe I just imagined it, but it was just so, so clear to me. Even the fact that the truck shook was a detail that was just too realistic to be my imagination. And plus, I have one more thing too. I wasn't the only one who actually saw it. My girlfriend saw it out of the window at one point, though not as clearly as I had seen it. She did some digging and other people have seen a similar creature in the area apparently. And that makes it clear to me that what I saw was real. I still doubt it to some degree, I guess, because, I mean, how could it be real, right? But I just cannot see any other way to explain it. I still wonder what would have happened to me if I hadn't turned around when I did. It seemed like it might have been stalking me or something. I can only imagine in terror what it might have done to me if I hadn't have turned around and saw it. I'm honestly traumatized from this experience as silly as that may seem. I feel embarrassed saying it in fact, but it's true. I know sightings like this to me before I experienced it myself would just make me think these people are crazy or they're making it up for attention, fame, they're faking it. But now I'm more open-minded towards people's experiences. I, I don't want to be famous or anything, I just want someone to know what I experienced that night. I want to know what it is that I might have actually seen, if anyone has any idea. So please, do let me know what you think. I'm never moving to the countryside again, mind you, ever. I'd rather get stabbed by some homeless Austinite than live out there and die from whatever that creature was. So this happened in like... I would say 2017. I was walking home from school. My mum worked late and my father was out for a business trip. My brother's college was farther away so he always came half an hour to an hour after me. But when I go home myself I would always take the shortcut. It was an enclosed path with rarely any people. There was a man a few steps behind me at one point and since I was a young and dumb child I didn't think too much of it. When the enclosed path ended and connected to the sidewalk, I saw the guy getting in a white van. Getting slightly suspicious now, I started running to my house, noticing the van was following me. He was definitely following me too, and I wasn't just being paranoid. I took a couple of wrong turns, but the van just kept on staying behind me, so I took a detour, and when I finally thought that I'd lost him, I ran back to my house and locked all my doors and windows. After I did this, I looked outside and I saw the white van sitting at the front of my house. I frantically called my mother and my brother. My mum wouldn't be home for like another few hours and my brother had half an hour left. My mum told me to go to my parents' room and get a gun. I went into my parents' room and went to their closet and got a gun. Mind you, the closest thing that I ever did to shooting was archery, so I wasn't really ready for this or anything. In any case, I went downstairs with a gun and grabbed a knife. My mum was calling the police, by the way. I went to the window and saw somebody trying to peek into the house. And with that, 
I pointed a gun at them and threatened them. Upon seeing me with the gun, they left and ran away. My brother finally came home and I told him what happened. We looked at the security camera and we saw him trying to get in through the back door and giving up and coming to the window to peek in. After my mum came home, the cops showed up. They tried to trace his license plate number and all that. I would see that same white van pass my house every day until the police finally caught him. Turns out, he was actually an escaped convict, high on something. So, am I glad that I had that gun that day and that he didn't get in? So, for starters, I live in a very secluded area. We do have neighbours, but plenty of space in between us. About a good horse pasture, or maybe two. You can't really hear each other from that distance, unless you're being very loud, which even then you can't hear them well. Well, tonight I was walking my dog and misjudged the time a little bit. It was dark, but he needed to get on with his business. I turned on my flashlight and told him to stay close. I verbally expressed to him, yes, my dog, that it was dark and I didn't want to walk too far. Eventually, though, I shook off my worry and decided to go a little bit further than I would have liked. I've always been scared of the dark a bit, I guess, but it bothers me sometimes more than others. At this point, we are far enough from the house that I can only see around me from the flashlight I have my house in view, but the porch light is very old and doesn't span out over the yard or anything. I don't come out this far at night unless my husband is with me usually. But when Buddy began to head back, I heard a sound. At first, I thought it was a bird in a nearby tree. I stood there for a second to pinpoint the direction that it was coming from. When I looked around, it grew louder. I'm obviously uneasy at this point. The reality of how far away from home we are begins to set in. I start walking toward Buddy so that we can make our way back. And that was when the sound grows closer. It takes me back for a second and it sounds almost like a, a flock of birds, though not. It's as if someone was playing a sound of birds on a tape recorder or something. I glance over to my dog and he's looking toward the sound with his head tilted on the side. I look to where he's facing and notice that it's in the deepest part of the woods on our property. I tell Buddy that it's time to go inside. I didn't hide the panic in my voice or anything and that's when the sound seemed to pick up pace and grows even closer. I run as fast as I can to the house. Buddy thankfully knows that if mum is running then he should too. We got to the house fine and the sound only faded as we got to the fence. Buddy was very alert for the next couple of minutes and wouldn't leave my side. I've tried to calm myself down by considering that my neighbors have chickens or whatever. The thing is is that the only neighbor that has them doesn't live on that end of the wood line. In fact, no one does. Not for a few miles at least. It's just open land there. By some chance that this sounds crazy and you think that it was probably just birds... I sort of do too, but you first have to understand that my parents are farmers. That they have many types of birds. Chickens, guineas, ducks, turkeys, parrots, inside pets, etc. So I should have been able to identify them pretty well. But they were unlike anything that I've ever heard. If you take anything from this, then please avoid going outside alone at night with a bad flashlight and unarmed. I hope that this doesn't happen again to me, but eventually I'm going to have to take Buddy for another walk. So my grandma and I live in a small two-bedroom house, and honestly, I hate it. I cannot leave my room at night without a light because I always feel like I'm being watched. Without a light is even worse and I get chills and I feel sick to my stomach with anxiety that I'm in fact being watched. Around the same time every night without fail, I can also hear something on my roof. I discarded it as cats at first, but 
there's no way that it's cats because there's no way for them to really get on the roof without injury. Around 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. I can hear thumps and they sound like a man is walking up there. They move across the whole house. Sometimes they're loud and sometimes they're not. My dog at one point was crying to go outside and of course I couldn't just not let her out. So me and my dog went outside and it was around 3 in the morning. I was talking to my dog the whole time because I felt more comfortable doing so. But eventually I realized that I sounded sort of insane and stopped. But man, do I wish that I hadn't have. Because I could then hear snoring. But once I realized something was snoring and knew the direction of the snore, I made the mistake of flashing my light towards it. I felt like I was in danger and it's a hard thing to describe because you just need to know the feeling but I got my dog back inside and that feeling just never went away. I went straight into my room and I shook in my bed. In the past when I was younger I would hear the thumps and I would get scared, bury myself in the blankets because if I was hiding then it couldn't hurt me but now I sort of just get a spike of anxiety that doesn't seem to go away until like one in the morning. I talked to my grandma about it once and she told me to just ignore it because it would just go away. She covers the windows every night with blinds and a blanket, but with her old age she can no longer do this. I asked her why she did this at one point and she explained that it was because it couldn't see in if she did this. I want to start covering up the windows myself, but she advised me not to because it's too much work. I want to bring up the thumps again, but I'm scared that she'll say the same thing as before and just sort of discard it. My dog is a big girl and she hates loud noises. She is my protector, but she's also a big chicken without a doubt. She growls when she hears the thumping though and will crawl into my bed and protective stand over me sort of. The only way that I can get her to stop is by petting her and telling her that it's okay. Whatever is around my house though, it has my dog very upset. I don't know if it's a person or something else, but whatever the case, I would really like some advice. I moved to California in May. Having lived in Utah most of my life, this was a big change. Where I'm from is fairly safe. I could walk home at night and usually not worry too much. Everyone has warned me how dangerous this area can be and to be vigilant. I carry pepper spray with me and I've never really had any issues. That is until tonight. So I ride the fast transit train system pretty often, usually at least a few times a week. To get there from my apartment, I have to walk about a mile, most of which is an enclosed trail that runs behind a neighborhood and next to the train tracks. There's one entrance on one end, one in the middle, and the other end opens up to the train station parking lot. Last week, as I was walking home at around 10, I had to walk past a man who was pretty obviously homeless. It seemed like he was looking for something that he'd lost, and he was talking to himself... I had to walk past him to get home, so I try to just put my head down and quickly walk past. But he blocks my way, saying, Excuse me, hey, did you see this thing about this big... Gestures with his hands. But when you were walking through here? Confused, I say. Uh, what? Uh, no, sorry. And hurriedly walk away. I can hear him trying to talk more to me, but... I kept going and he luckily didn't follow. A few days later I encountered him again on the same trail and he tried to talk to me again but I just said sorry I don't know what you're talking about and kept going. Well tonight I walk onto the train station and he's coming out of the elevator as I'm going down the escalator and starts yelling at me excuse me wait ma'am. I ignore him but he follows me and won't leave me alone, so I turn around and say, what? He says, hey, did you see my speaker? You know, since you were on the trail that night. I tell him no, that I don't know what he's talking about. He then says, well, can I look in your backpack real quick? Because you're looking really guilty right now. I tell him no, and 
He then gets mad and takes a step towards me, so I pull out my pepper spray and tell him, leave me alone or I'll pepper spray you. He starts yelling about how he doesn't care and how I better not have his stuff, but he walks away eventually. I walk to the far end of the platform away from him and call my roommate and tell her what's happening. That is when the guy walks up holding a hatchet that he tries to hide under his jacket and I hold up my pepper spray and stand up and tell him to back up because I'm not playing around anymore. He puts his hands up and backs away. My roommate calls the transit police for me. I can hear the guy screaming somewhere upstairs in the station. Luckily, my train pulled up right then and I hopped on. I really hope that I don't see this guy again and that this was the last time that I have to interact with him. Because quite honestly, I do not have this guy's speakers. I was around 12 years old and sitting on the back of my dad's truck with the tailgate down. I was waiting on my friend to meet up with me so that we could go and do whatever 12 year olds do on a weekend. It was a spring day in Georgia, so everything was alive and pretty noisy. Dogs were barking, birds were chirping, and bugs were screaming. After sitting there for a while, everything just goes silent all of a sudden. There wasn't even a peep. I look around to see if there were any birds or dogs around me, but there wasn't. When I turned back to look at the street, there was a black, misty, shapeless form walking from my neighbors across the street from me to their neighbor's yard. As I'm watching it move, I whispered in disbelief, what the heck is that? Apparently it heard me too because it stopped as soon as I said it and looked like it was turning towards me, although it was shapeless and it was thinner while moving and kind of thickened out like a normal person would when you look at them head on. It stood there though for what felt like a while and I'm guessing that it stared me down. My heart was beating very fast and I don't think that I was breathing this time. It started to move towards me and was about to step into the street when I heard my friend yell to me from up the street. The way the houses were built, she couldn't see the side of the street with the form. I stabbed my head to her and raised my hand so that she knows that I'm there and I immediately go back to look for the form but when I did, it wasn't there anymore. Once I saw that it was gone, Everything all of a sudden came back to life it seemed. All the noise expected at springtime hit me at once and I became extremely overwhelmed and I even started to cry. My friend reached me and saw that I was crying. She was rightfully confused and asked why I was so upset. I told her everything that I experienced and she got really quiet. She told me that she had seen it too, not long before I did at her house, she lived a street over, and told me that she was terrified during the encounter. She said that it started to move towards her from her neighbor's yard, like me, into hers and she was completely frozen. She broke out of that trance because her mum told her that she needed to come inside for dinner now, and when she looked back, just like me, it was gone. Because we were so spooked by that, we decided that it was a good day to have a movie marathon. I never did see it again, but I do believe that I had other encounters with it. I am pretty skeptical, but open to the idea that paranormal and interdimensional entities can or do actually exist but I always try to debunk why or if paranormal things happen. Weird sounds, bumps, etc. Anyways, when I was around 10 or 13 years old, I cannot actually remember the exact age. My sister and I were playfully chasing each other, uh, just around the house and playing hide and seek, and it was my turn to count and go look for her. I returned to the living room, like a den area but wider space, and this room was where the base or safe spot was when the hider tries to avoid you. I finished up counting and as I was saying, ready or not, here I come, I remember getting this weird feeling just sort of overcoming me like I was being watched. I 
whipped my head around to look behind me and there in one of the corners of the room was a short, probably four foot, pale, dark cloaked but no hood covering their facial features, scared looking bald man staring at me huddled in the corner like they were scared and surprised I was able to see them. It definitely was not human from what I can remember and I was able to discern quickly in my head that it presented male-like qualities and features. I didn't feel any malevolence from this being or ill intentions, but as quickly as I blinked after seeing it, whatever it was, was gone. And I remember being confused for a bit, but my brain went back to just wanting to play. I do recall avoiding that spot in the corner for a while and feeling scared to get close to it, and my mum asked what was going on with why I was acting sort of weary of the corner and I told her about the figure but she said that it could have been my imagination and I just left it at that. I'm not sure why it's bothering me lately but just wondering if anyone has had a similar experience or knows anything, legends, myths, etc. about a small pale hunched over cloaked and scared looking bald man in the corner. Although it certainly could have been just a child's imagination, I really don't think it was. So, I want to start off by saying that I don't believe in anything paranormal or supernatural. I'm definitely a man of science and believe everything can be explained by it. But, with that said... I still don't understand what I actually saw. I live in Lubbock, Texas, and next to my town there's another smaller town about 20 minutes out called Wilson. Me and my three friends were just hanging out one cold night and saw that it was getting late, about three-ish in the morning. My friend lived in Wilson at the time, so we decided to drop off first to get that long drive out of the way, and after we dropped him off, we got back on the highway heading back into our town. As soon as we got onto the interstate, we entered some misty fog, but we had drove this trip plenty of times before, but this time we noticed something different standing right on the grassy median. What we saw was a figure of a person, dressed in an all-white gown with long straight black hair facing away from us. I was driving and decided to slow down to get a better look. The second that we got close to the figure... It turned its head like an owl to reveal the pale face of a woman, screaming at us, then jumped in front of the car and flew up using their giant white wings. It wasn't a gown at all, in fact. It was wings covering her entire body. I don't know if it was just me, but I could feel her eyes burning a hole in mine when she looked at us. The image of this giant bird woman still haunts me to this day. At the time, we were at a loss for words. We didn't understand what had just happened, and in a matter of a few seconds, we witnessed some, well, unexplainable creature, and just as fast as it appeared, it was gone. So, if anyone else has had a similar experience, then please feel free to share it with me. This woman has been living rent-free in my mind for years now, and I really just want to figure out what that thing was. Seven or eight years ago, I stayed overnight at Waverly Hills Sanitarium with some friends. We really had a blast, but other than accidentally frightening ourselves, really not much happened. That is, until just before dawn while we were in the surgery on the fourth or fifth floor. I looked out the window and I saw what I first thought was an injured dog, then possibly a wounded deer because it was bigger than a dog. It was sort of scuttling around down there like a crab and just looked, I don't know, wrong. After a few seconds, it came out of the shadows and I got a better look at it. It looked like a, a very tall, thin humanoid doing the crab walk, bent over backwards with its face looking up at me. I couldn't make out any features, but it sure felt like it was looking right at me. Then it scuttled off into the shadows again. It happened so fast that I didn't have time to say anything, but when I turned around, one of my friends was standing behind me, 
and he said, Did you just see that? We were both stunned and didn't tell anyone else at first. I asked the tour guide if people ever reported seeing things on the grounds, and he replied with, People see things crawling around down there all the time. And well, that was certainly a bit of a shock. But that's my story, and I wish there was more to it, but I'm kind of glad that there isn't. It's a, a weird event in my life that I don't think I'll ever forget. In 2006, I went on a choir tour of Spain and France. The tour started in Madrid and ended in the Occitane region. This experience happened in Lourdes, France. Already in Spain, I was having many deja vu experiences and memories of past life recall. One of the strangest experiences was visiting the Cathedral of Burgos and being able to talk with a tour guide with complete familiarity about the church. At the end of the tour, she said, you know a lot. I even took some of our group who didn't do the paid tour back the next day and did the entire thing exactly as she had done the day before. But the most unequivocal paranormal experience happened in Lourdes. Lourdes is a small town in southwestern France that is famous for Saint Bernadette, a teenage shepherdess who had visions of the Virgin Mary in 1858. On our first day in Lourdes, our tour guide told us about how it had been a Roman outpost before Christianity with a temple to the water goddess. This is important because all of the imagery of Lourdes is water imagery. There's a huge tank of water to be dunked in to heal the sick. Everywhere you look, there are bottles in the shape of the Virgin Mary. Your travel through the town is constantly interrupted by streams and rivers of people. You get the idea. Sick Catholics flock to Lords for pilgrimage and healing. It's extremely common to see groups of people in wheelchairs and even on stretchers at the sites, especially the grotto where Bernadette had her visions and on top of which the Church of Lords is built. This is the main pilgrimage site. Now, although I'm not a Catholic, the tour guide had piqued my curiosity and I decided to go down to the grotto to vibe it out. In front of the grotto was an empty space followed by five or six rows of benches with more empty space behind it. All of this was fenced in. When I got there, I wasn't able to go into the grotto because it was the designated time for stretches. The benches in the center were full, but there was a bench at the very back against the fence where I decided to sit and just wait. The minute that I sat down though, I began to feel a, a buzzing sensation that only got stronger and stronger. The energy was so strong that it pushed my head down towards my knees. Through the buzz, I then heard this voice. You will see where Bernadette saw the lady for the very first time. As usual, I was pretty skeptical, but I took it under consideration. At around this time, the stretchers moved out of the area and people started lining up from the benches in the center. I moved to those center benches starting at the left corner until it filled up, and as it did I slid down the bench until I was sort of sitting at the far right corner of it. Once there I thought maybe I should say some kind of oblation, so I started singing the choral version of Ava Maria that we were singing on our tour in my head, and as I did so, the buzzing vibration became overwhelming and I started silently crying. The entire bench held space for me while I cried without ever speaking to or touching me. After I finished crying, I knew that I didn't need to go into the grotto. I had my Lord's Grotto experience and that was enough for me. When I reached down to get my backpack though, I saw a bronze plaque on the ground which said, This is where St. Bernadette saw the Virgin Mary for the first time on the 11th of February, 1858 which means that I had been sitting on the spot the entire time. It was a, a strange experience and I still don't really know what to think about all of it. I'll never forget the buzzing feeling that had occurred and also hearing the voices, but yeah, I know it sounds crazy and all that, but it really happened to me and I don't really share it with many people.
So I was around eight when we moved into an old house or sort of shop combination. At the bottom is a commercial building with a big open room, a kitchen and two medium sized rooms connected to each other and one connected to the open room. Upstairs is the living space. The layout of the bottom is fairly important but also the kitchen leads into the stairs but you cannot see the kitchen from the open room. So we moved in and from the start I despised the place. I just got bad, horrible, dare I say energy from the place and I don't tend to get those. In the open room there was a large painting with a strange representation of what would seem to be a rapture experience or event. It was a burning cross on top of a large bible, a, a church with a crowd surrounding it and a river on fire. Every time I would walk by this painting, my stomach sank horribly. Imagine watching someone that you love die. It was that sort of feeling. We got rid of this painting very soon after we left, but the energy from that spot just remained. The previous owners were an older couple, but the husband had died about five years before we moved in, leaving the lady as a widow. She was strange, to say the least. They had lived there for like two decades and she was just so emotionless. Obviously this could have been grief but it was five years ago that he died. She was extremely emotionless as if she was dead in the body of a living person and had this look in her eyes as if she had seen unimaginable things. Anyways, we moved in nonetheless and there were already problems. Everywhere that you were upstairs, you would always feel like you were being watched by something, but always watched. There was a mirror in front of the stairs that I swear was cursed. I just couldn't look at that thing without having a, a panic attack. My room went dark, I literally couldn't look into, like my body just sort of restricted me. The lady that lived there too really did not clean the place ever. The lady that lived there as well never cleaned the place. There were strangely piles of flies everywhere as well. They seemed like they were an offering of some sort, the way that they were laid out in a perfect mound like that. But anyway, there actually weren't many, but the few events that did happen were major. For one, soon after we moved in, my aunt came over. My aunt is more like an older sister. Long story, but... Soon after she left, she told me at a, a family gathering that when she was there, she saw a four-legged creature that had the face of a humanoid, but long stretched hind legs and long teeth. You might think that she was just trying to scare me. I know that, but she really just isn't the type. Then we took a photo of nothing important, but just a photo. And in this photo, there was a face in it, a humanoid face that was completely pale like completely white, pitch black eyes, and no hair. The structure was an oval, but a human head, I guess, like a stretched oval. And the next day, literally, my mum and I went down to the cellar. The cellar door was next to the spot that had the large painting in it. When we went into the cellar, the door locked behind us. And this really surprised us because the door's lock had two steps that couldn't be done by accident. It was a chain with like a little latch thing that you pretty much see everywhere, but when we closed the door, the chain was down near the floor and nowhere near the latch. But when the door closed behind us, that latch was locked. This happened when me and my mum were home alone with nobody able to let us out for like hours as well. Therefore, we were trapped for hours down there. This was the last straw for us and after that we decided to move out. I still cannot wrap my head around what I saw and felt and heard in my head. If there's any way to debunk this, then please do let me know. I live in a rural area in Florida. This happened a few weeks ago and I was driving by myself at around midnight I came to a stoplight where there's a cemetery on the right and new apartment buildings on the left as well. 
This particular light is extremely long since it's not activated by sensors when you pull up at the light. So I'm waiting for a few minutes and all of a sudden I instinctively sort of look behind me. It felt like someone was watching me intently. About 30 feet away from where I was waiting for the light is a bus stop behind me. Right in front of the benches where you wait for the bus, I see a huge figure that looks like a wolf or a giant dog. I'm staring at it, thinking to myself, wow, that's an enormous dog. All the while, I start to feel goosebumps. I feel my heart start racing, and I just cannot figure out why. I then start to feel, and bear with me here, evil thoughts in my head. I say feel because I couldn't make out what the words were being said. I just remember while I was staring at this dog that... I felt like it was mocking me, laughing and sort of challenging me. Then, I see the figure stand up on two legs while staring in my direction. It stood up and was suddenly taller than the top of the bus overhang, but it didn't look like a human. It looked like an animal just started standing on two legs. Meanwhile, I'm still waiting for this light to turn green and... Keep in mind there's lights all around the bus stop, but this figure was absolutely pure black. The figure was stood up on two legs and now it looked like a huge dog with an alpaca neck and body, but the neck looked really girthy as well. I see this thing continue to stare in my direction and I think to myself, okay, this is really weird, but even if it is my imagination, it's going to disappear when I start driving. The whole time I'm feeling panicked and I hear on my head, run but I can chase you. I step on the gas and get out of there. The light is still red mind you but I didn't care at that point and drive away as quickly as I can. And then I looked behind me as I was driving in my rearview mirror and this figure is sprinting at full speed on all fours behind me. It looked like a deranged wolf was chasing me. I felt pure panic as I was speeding away and maybe out of instinct I yelled, I have God with me, you can't hurt me, nothing can hurt me, I'm protected by my angels and by God. I'm paraphrasing there, but it was at that point that I realized I was feeling like I was being choked. Because after I said that out loud, I felt like I could breathe. I didn't feel like I was being chased anymore and when I looked back, the thing was gone. Now, am I going insane here? I do believe in the paranormal and I actually still believe in skinwalkers as well, but I honestly hope that I was just imagining things because this happened two minutes from my house. Please let me know what you think about this and if you have any advice for me, then I would love to hear it. In 2018, I lived with my partner and my German Shepherd in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old and our apartment was a fourth floor walk-up unit, very typical low-budget Chicago rental in a changing neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to this story, so our building had a total of 12 units, mine and the three below me had a shared front entrance, and the other eight units were through a second entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to a rear gate, which led to an alleyway. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches, so you can see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door through that window. We had good relations with our neighbors, especially those who lived directly below us and shared our front door, and this was the thing that saved all three of us my partner, my dog, and me. So, my partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for the weekends or weeks at a time and it was a scary thing for me because I'd have been assaulted and stalked by an ex in my teens and twenties. I always worried something would trip him off and he'd start stalking me again or whatever. A little less than a month before a two-week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a pretty creepy Facebook message from that stalker or ex from yet another new account. About a week after that, my car was broken into, the glove box was emptied, things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. 
I had about $20 and change in the compartment between the seats, and they left that money, so that was really weird. I was on high alert though at that point, and very scared about the time that I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me in the situation, and felt that it was too last minute to cancel, especially over what amounted to a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't really direct threats or anything. And truthfully, car break-ins are very, very common in Chicago. It's happened to me like 15 times, and police usually do the reports over the phone and don't even come to the scene now. What I found really strange though was that the thief didn't take any money. There was a homeless guy though who had started camping on the boulevard nearby recently as well. In any case, my partner left for his tour and I set up cameras and bought door braces for my front and back doors. I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea, maybe because she was picking up on my stress level or something. And it meant that I was taking her down all four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels like six or seven times a night. I had the distinct prickly crawling sensation of being watched though when I would take her out. But I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was just my own fear and paranoia. Her diarrhea lasted an unusually long time, like three or four days. I was going in and out of the main door a lot, feeling very scared, and I noticed that some of my neighbors wouldn't pull the door all the way closed, so the lock was engaged. I mentioned it to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of the stalker. He was supportive, said that he had mentioned it to the other neighbors if he saw them, and I noticed that the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner eventually came home at about 11am on a Sunday morning. At about 8.30am that morning, my first floor neighbor's place was burglarized. He was a metalhead dude who collected instruments, sold weed and psychedelics, and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast and he left his door unlocked while he was gone. Someone had come in, eating the leftovers in his fridge, took a coat and pair of boots, and also left a filthy coat and a pair of boots, took his college diploma, but left $500 in the same cabinet. They also left all of the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the first floor apartment and a master key for the front door and the back gate. Now, my neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in and the second floor neighbor said to go and tell me because I had a stalker. So my metalhead neighbor came up to let me know what had happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked at the front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin but looked through the people, recognized him and the three of us stood on the stairs at my front door while he told us about the break-in. We sort of jabbered jawed for a while, about 15 to 20 minutes, and while we were talking, we heard the front door open and close below us, but didn't think anything of it. Then we saw a man climbing up my back porch, my steps that is, to my back door through the window. There was no other apartment that he could have been going to, and he had to walk past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. He was not my stalker, I didn't recognize him, but his image is burned in my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high top sneakers, not the ones stolen from downstairs. His black coat was oversized and hanging off of his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window and he froze halfway up the stairs to my back porch. He slowly took a cell phone and called someone as he slowly turned around halfway up the steps. He walked back down the stairs in a really artificially sort of slow motion way, like he was pretending to be nonchalant and then bolted into a sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs and dialed 911. My partner and I ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and windowless van pull out from the sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out of the alleyway. We didn't get the plates, but the cops said that it wouldn't have mattered because there wasn't any crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They very condescendingly explained this to me as they took my statement later. My neighbor is the one who actually made the call and has the police report. 
My partner and I were just considered witnesses at this point. For a long time too, the thing that scared me the most was the tool that my neighbor found when he went downstairs. It was a two by four piece of wood cut to about two feet, but about six inches of it had been made into a handle. It looked a bit like a paddle and for a long time I couldn't figure out what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was a ram for the door jam or the locks. When I looked at my door afterward, it looked like the frame had been repaired as well, like it had been broken open before. And it seems like they used the one master key to place their ram, get somebody at the back door to catch me if I tried to run out that way, and somebody else was going to come back around since they only had one key, and they'd break in my front door and go forward with whatever they had planned. When we caught them before they could catch me unaware, they seemed to have aborted the plan, I guess, and I suspect that they'd been watching me, especially while I was taking out my dog, and figured that I was alone. It was pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home 30 minutes before all of this, and I feel like we all could have been horribly injured or worse had we been trapped inside and they'd gotten the jump on us. Nothing else ever really came of this, except that my landlord refused to change the locks, but he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago and now have added a younger dog I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights and wingnut neighbors, so this time I feel a lot safer. Like I said, thankfully nothing happened, but it definitely felt like a near miss. I'm a male, 27 years old now, that was born in Italy. A pretty standard family, I guess. Just an older sister of three years, and except for arguments between our parents, things have always been pretty normal. These arguments never escalated into violence, fortunately, but there was a lot of verbal abuse, so both of us always wanted to get out as soon as we could. Why am I mentioning this? Because... It's part of the reason, as you'll see soon, why both of us spent so much time outside. Also because I want to clarify that my sister and I have always been polar opposite regarding the paranormal. She's always been fascinated by it, always interested, and she would have liked to have had some experiences regarding it. Me? Heck no. I've pretty much always been the opposite. Give me serial killers, crazy people, or whatever, and I'm fine with it. But paranormal things? I never wanted to have anything to do with it. Well, I guess joke's on me, because weird things always happen to me, and never to her. So, here's some of the things that happened. The first experience, I spent a lot of time inside my cousin's house when I was younger specifically around 12 to 13 years old, up to about 18 years old. I slept there a lot of times, even for weeks in fact, mainly because, as I said before, I didn't want to stay at my house as much as possible, didn't want to be there to hear the arguments. His house is more like a, a villa, I guess. There's this sort of big lake at the center of the property, and all the territory around it is part of the property as well. Walking in a circle around it at a slow pace will take you around maybe an hour if you don't explore and just follow the trail and historically this was an ancient Roman port before the landscape was changed. In other words, it's extremely close to the sea. The house itself was about two floors and from when we were 12 to 13 years old up until 16, we would always sleep together in one room. It didn't matter if we had to bring out a bunk bed we just feared sleeping far away from each other since the house was big and in the middle of nowhere. I hadn't had any experiences yet, but we just felt like that. But then, stuff started happening, but only ever to me. The first time it happened was when I was about 13 years old. We were all sleeping in the same room and it was the four of us. Me, my younger cousin, my older cousin and my aunt. It was in the middle of the night, and that night all of us went to bed as usual. Nothing weird happened before. None of us felt any way in particular. In other words, it was a pretty standard night, really. 
I was sleeping peacefully. Then, without a, a reason or a rhyme, I just sort of woke up. I sort of sat down in my bed and in front of me, there was this thing. I say thing because it didn't really have a proper form. The best way that I can describe it was as if some had covered themselves in a, a white blanket and that you could sort of see were only the superficial features of it. And I knew it was female, the outlines were feminine and for some reason I just knew it. Now, usually I am very analytical and irrational person so against any kind of instinct I just sort of sat there without panicking and I started rationalizing I guess you could say. Thinking about it now I really wanted to scream and call myself an idiot but whatever. I looked at it and this thing looked at me I guess and my first thought was oh maybe it's just a blanket on the chair in front of me or something. I looked down on my bed but no. I was using the blanket because it was winter and it was cold. Then, without even raising my eyes, I thought, then maybe it's the dog? Because they had several dogs and one of them was a French bulldog with this white spot on its back, so maybe he was just sleeping on the chair in front of me and that was the reason for what I was seeing. I turned around and the dog was sleeping on the bed next to me on my cousin's legs. I turned around once more and... That thing was still there. It hadn't moved an inch. I just sort of stared at it. In the end shrugged my shoulders not having an explanation. And just lied back in bed going back to sleep. It sounds crazy but the morning after when I realized what had happened. I was almost freaking out asking myself why the heck I reacted like that. But in that precise moment I didn't feel in danger nor any kind of bad sensation. It was peaceful and it felt like it didn't matter, which is weird to say I know because normally you would just get up and get the heck out of there or at least tell someone, right? That's what I think now, but that's what I did. I just laid back down and went back to sleep. If anyone's wondering too, at which time of the night it was that I woke up, it was three in the morning. I know this because in front of me there was a TV with the decoder below it which would always show the current time so I could clearly see it when this happened. Now the second experience, always with my cousins but this time it was late afternoon and always in winter, it was around the end of January. It was me, my older cousin, our uncle and my aunt. This time I was 14 years old. We were just taking a walk around the lake and there was a, a still light. It was around 5 p.m. Everything was pretty normal up to that point. My cousin and I were walking in front of the adults. Not too far, but just a few meters and we could still clearly talk between the four of us without yelling and that's what we were doing. Just talking casually and enjoying the stroll. At a certain point we reached an old bridge made out of stone it's always been there and you need to cross it if you want to continue walking since the water from the lake passes below it. We started crossing, not walking fast at all when suddenly both my cousin and I started hearing a voice, a female voice. It wasn't a bad voice I guess, the tone of it was very light as if a whisper in the wind but the point is is that this whisper was repeated several times. And this whisper was also calling our names, both of us. It lasted around maybe 10 seconds and both of us could hear it as if the voice was moving from sort of left to right in front of us, as if someone was walking away and thus the voice was getting further and further away. Both of us of course looked back behind us at first, thinking that the adults were pranking us but while we were still hearing the voice they were just sort of casually talking between each other. So we turned around, stick next to each other and kept walking without saying anything because, I mean, what are we going to say? When we almost reached the end of the bridge, the voice disappeared. Let's say around five seconds passed from the moment it stopped calling our names. My cousin's mother called us from behind and she asked us why we didn't stop the old man in front of us. The point is though is that there was no old man. She said that he just walked right in front of us from the left to the right, dressed in some weird clothes as if from another time. And when she told us that, we sprinted immediately, 
running past the end of the bridge to see if we could see anyone. But of course, there wasn't anybody and no footprints left either. Now, imagine this. At the bridge, there is a sort of grass in front of you and the trail that keeps going on. On the right side, you just fall directly into the lake and on the left side, there is a bit more land, except for the fact that there is a stone wall going all around the property. It's tall too, around eight to nine meters. And as if this isn't enough as well, the wall is covered in bushes and branches, making it impossible to approach it without making an absolute ruckus. In other words, how this guy disappeared like that, we still have no idea. We told them about the voice after this, which they didn't hear, and apparently they saw this old man, which we didn't see. After it, we just finished our stroll, and I guess we just never really talked about it again. The third thing that happened, and this was a bad idea, and we were stupid teenagers, I know, but it was Halloween night, and I was 16 years old. Again, same property, same cousin, same place, well, sort of anyway. Lately, all of us had started playing Dungeons and Dragons, and we started like role-playing games and all that. And we decided that for the Halloween night, we wanted to do something scary. So, we decided to go to this old rural building inside the property. We called it the Towers because, in medieval times, it was a small building with two towers, one on each side. In that moment, it was being renovated, but since it was night and there was no one working there, and due to the fact that it was inside their own property, it was kind of okay to just barge into it, as long as we didn't cause any damage. So we brought our Book of Vampire, The Masquerade, a few things with us to set up the mood, since we decided that we were going to play it inside the building, and that was it. It was, again, my older cousin, my younger cousin, a friend of ours, and me. We set out around 9pm, so of course it was already dark, and when we reached the place by walking it, it was already 11. Now, to give you an idea of this building, the ground floor was already covered in concrete, so it was full of dust and gravel. There were no doors or windows yet, just openings covered in the classic green net that the workers put on in order to cover and not let people see through them and all that. Below the ground floor was the basement. It was big and much like the ground floor. We didn't go there because it's pitch black dark down there. No light, no water high to your ankles. And honestly, it was pretty scary looking as well. We knew that it was simply the place where the workers were working on the old foundations, but still, we didn't want to go down there. Then, there was the tower still left standing on the right side. The one on the left at the time was already demolished. At this point, we decided to split up. My cousin started walking the stairs to go up while this friend of ours and me decided to stay there waiting for them. And this is when things started going wrong. At first, we heard something falling from the tower down below. And of course, at first, we sort of thought that it was because my cousins were trying to play a prank on us. So we just decided to laugh and shrug it off. Then we noticed a shadowy black figure running outside the building. How did we notice? Because the green nets to block vision were not in a good condition, so we could see pretty much the outside, and also because we had torches pointing in that direction. Whatever it was, it had no shape whatsoever. Just a sort of shadowy human figure, or humanoid I guess. Not that tall, that passed really quickly in front of us in the outside. We obviously started to worry about this, but still, we were trying to be brave and laugh it off. Again though, something fell from the tower and we started shouting at my cousins to stop, that they were not being funny. Right after we did this, the most crazy thing happened. Dust started raising around us and footprints started appearing on the ground, as if someone was running in a circle around us. But... We couldn't see anybody. There was absolutely nobody there. And yet we could clearly see this happening in front of our eyes. After that, we just ran the heck out of there, scared half to death, looking around and waiting for my cousins to come back as well. We just had to wait like five minutes and they came back. We of course sweared at them saying that 
We knew that it was them that were throwing stuff from the top of the tower and they laughed it off, admitting that they indeed threw down a brick. But they looked at us in genuine confusion when we told them about the second thing that they threw off. They had no idea whatsoever and they told us more and more times that they didn't do it. Also because when they came back down, there was nothing else different except from the brick that they threw down the tower. After this, we bolted out and we decided that we were just going to watch a movie at home that night. And that was it. The rest of the night was pretty peaceful. There are also some other things that happened too. Like one time I dreamt one year in advance of my aunt having a kid, including name, sex and in which day he or she would be born. Another time I dreamt about the same thing in advance around one year and some months more, this time for another aunt of mine, again name and sex and in which day he or she would be born. I got everything right as well, both times. Another time I was woke up at 3pm in the house of my parents, with no reason whatsoever, just a sort of terrible sensation, and my first thought was, I need to call my cousins. No explanation whatsoever, just that sort of terrible feeling and sudden thought of it. Of course, I calmed down and went back to sleep because, I mean, what the heck, right? Who calls people at like 3 in the morning because of a gut feeling? Well, short story. The morning after, my mother barged into my room saying that something happened. And apparently, lightning struck my cousin's kitchen, starting a fire, and almost hit the gas canister. And at which time did it happen? 3.30 in the morning. Luckily, the younger one was awake because he was going to the bathroom, noticed the fire and woke up everyone, so nothing bad happened. Still, I still tell myself today that if I ever feel something like that again, then next time I'm just going to make the call. Since I stopped meditating and doing this kind of stuff, these kind of dreams and experiences have died down a lot. I don't know if it's connected or whatever, but just in case... I decided to stop. During the summer of 2008, I stayed with an aunt and uncle for a few months because I wasn't getting along with my parents. Another story for another day, that one. But while staying there, I worked overnights at a local convenience store. During the day, I was mostly alone while my aunt and uncle worked. At this point in my life, I had not experienced anything paranormal and didn't believe in ghosts or spirits or the afterlife. I was 19 and I knew everything after all. However, as soon as I moved in, I was faced with experiences that honestly changed my perspective forever. The first one, I was alone. It was about 9am and I had just finished my shift and I was preparing to wind down and get ready for bed. I was alone as usual. Both my aunt and uncle were working, so I had the house to myself. I was sitting in the downstairs living room just eating, when, out of seemingly nowhere, I heard what sounded like an adult running through the kitchen, which paralleled the living room and was completely out of view to me. A bang, and the footsteps went into the den that connected to the kitchen. I bolted up and went to the kitchen to investigate the sound. There was a coffee pot on the floor. That must have been the bang that I heard when it hit the floor. I headed towards the den to see who was in there. But when I did, it was empty. Now, there is no way for anyone to have been in the den and me not see them. I shrugged it off and figured that I was just tired and in the end I just went to bed. A few weeks later, my alarm woke me up at 9pm for work. I groggily got up and headed towards the bathroom that was directly across my room. However, the door was shut and I could see the light shining from under the door and I heard the distinct sound of someone sweeping the floor, like that swish sound. It sounded like an old-fashioned straw broom. I found this very odd considering that no one besides myself used that bathroom and I really couldn't think of why anyone would be sweeping it at 9pm at night. But I patiently waited some time for whoever was in there to finish up. After a few minutes, I couldn't wait any longer because I had to start getting ready for work. 
I approached the bathroom door. I could still hear the sweeping, mind you, and I gently knocked and asked if they were almost done. But to my surprise, the sound abruptly stopped. I opened the door and when I did, no one was there. I brushed this experience off as well and pushed it to the back of my mind, but I certainly was uneasy about that one. This last experience is the reason that I ended up moving out. It was too terrifying to ignore what I knew was happening in that house, and so it really was the last straw. So my sister stopped by during the day to see me, and her and I were in the back room just hanging out and chatting. The door to the hallway was closed. My aunt and uncle were working, so her and I were the only two people who were home. As we sort of gabbed away, we suddenly heard what sounded like 1920s music coming from downstairs. We froze and fell silent. The music grew louder and louder until it sounded like it was coming from every corner in the house. The music sounded like it was being played from a record player. And my sister and I just sort of stared at one another, too terrified to speak now. Then we heard what sounded like a party erupting from downstairs. It sounded like 30 or more people were downstairs, in fact. Sounds of laughing, talking, and chinaware clinking filled the house. Then, what we heard next terrified me. Loud, heavy footsteps started making their way upstairs where my sister and I were. They were booming, and it was slow but purposeful. The party sounds and music had reached a deafening level, but I could still hear those heavy footsteps above all the other sounds. Eventually, I heard the footsteps make it to the second floor. Then they slowly started stomping towards the closed door my sister and I sat behind. When the footsteps reached our door, I leapt up and yanked the door open. And when I did, all the noise in the house suddenly stopped. The party, the music, the stomping. There was obviously no one behind the door either. The hallway was empty and the house was dead silent again. My sister and I wasted no time racing out of the house and staying outside until our aunt and uncle came home. They didn't believe our story and I moved out shortly afterwards and never stepped foot in that house again. When I was in my early 20s, my friend and I were in my boyfriend's basement talking about the paranormal and discussing our views and experiences in that regard. There was a bedroom directly across from where we were sitting and neither of us liked the vibes coming from that empty room, which is what started the conversation. After a few minutes, I felt something bump the back of the couch hard, hard enough to make me bounce forward a little bit, and then I felt a hand on my shoulder. I didn't take it too seriously, I mean, maybe I was just imagining it, but she said that she felt it too. Whatever, I didn't believe her. But that's when I saw something absolutely horrific from the doorway of that room. I was absolutely certain that I imagined it, and wasn't going to say anything about it, but when she described the thing that I thought that I'd imagined, I was absolutely terrified. At the bottom of the doorway, a little being that I can only say looked a little like the head goblin from the movie Legend with Tom Cruise, except without the huge nose and had a scary face wide grin full of sharp teeth and greasy looking black ringlets of hair, sprang up diagonally from the near bottom of that dark doorway. It looked right at me, then it disappeared the same way that it appeared. I couldn't help the gasp that escaped me, but... As I said, I was going to keep it to myself, so neither of us questioned my sanity until she spoke up and said, I saw it too. Now, I hadn't told her what I saw, anything at all, but she went on to describe everything that I'd just seen, and I sat there speechless and scared. It didn't take long after that to gather up our belongings and zip past that dark doorway and sprint up those stairs as quickly as we could. After which, we never went down there again. When I was 22 years old, second year uni student, no drink, no drugs, living in the Stoke area of the UK, 
I rented an old middle terrace house in second year with my then girlfriend and also some friends. It was a, a creepy and dark house as it only had windows at the front and back. It had a, a dingy and damp old basement with lots of old furniture stuffed inside of it and a black cat would show up at the back door every night meowing, which I befriended and fed in the end. It was also creepy because of the dark and sort of muddy cul-de-sac that served as communal courtyard and car park as well. All of this didn't overly bother me, however, because I grew up in a pretty old house built in the early 1800s anyway. It did, as I later learned, bother my downstairs housemate and his girlfriend who heard regular footfalls at night in the hallway and adjacent living room only to find nobody when he'd sneak out to look. I also discovered a year after this event that students who lived there the year prior all believed the house was haunted and were glad to have moved out. So, on to my story. My term time ended four weeks after all the other tenants because I had to do clinical placement. This meant that I lived in this large house alone which I actually really loved. I'm a bit of an introvert and love alone time anyway so it suited me. It started great too. For two weeks I enjoyed it despite the background creepiness. I would just reason any creepiness away as I still do now. However, after the two week mark I became aware of a creeping sense of dread that I just couldn't rationalize or find cause for. I am not an overly anxious person by any means and I enjoy my own company and nothing weird had happened so it was a bit odd. I began to feel very unwelcome and very much not alone in the house. I felt how a, a prey animal must feel when they feel eyes on their back. I began to feel so scared that even in the day I would take the three mile walk onto campus and sit and work in the library, if not on placement. I would come home and be afraid. I even devised a system for moving around the house at night without ever being in an unlit area. I also did this during the day in the windowless areas too. I had to move from my large comfy room into the smallest bedroom, lock the door and sleep with my back to a wall, often with the light on. I was just inexplicably afraid and I couldn't explain it. On the final day I had to lock all the windows, turn off all plugs, get some stuff from the basement and lock the back door before I left. I was utterly terrified and felt like I was moving in slow motion the entire time. I went around systematically ensuring a light was always on and that I wasn't in darkness. I had piled all my stuff, backpack and duffel bag. The rest was mercifully packed in my car the day before at the front door. This is where things got really scary and I still cannot explain what happened adequately. It was late afternoon and still light outside, but the house was dark. I steeled myself to turn the hallway light off, but the light switch was about four meters away from the front door at the foot of the stairs. It was night dark upstairs, normal because no windows and all the doors were shut. But I turned the light off and scurried away without turning my back to the stairs. The daylight still lit the hallway from the open front door, but as I got to the door, the strangest thing happened. My neck hair stood on end. To my shame, if I needed to pee at that time, I think I would have peed myself, but I could feel or see, I, I can't explain, a black and sort of viscous shadowy cloud slowly making its way down the stairs towards me. I felt such malevolence, I basically tripped backwards into the street and into daylight, shut the door, and as soon as I did, everything felt fine like nothing had just happened. I got up immediately and locked the door and posted the key through the letterbox and have never seen that house again. Now, the only way that I can explain the feeling is to liken it to a Dementor and Ring Wraith attack, except there wasn't a caped humanoid figure chasing me. The fear and the dread was indescribable and I have never since experienced anything like it. To be clear as well, I have and have never had any mental health issues. I was happy and not stressed at the time. I've never taken any drugs or anything and I even feel crazy and sort of embarrassed relating this story, but if anyone else has had any other experience like this, then I would love to hear it. 
because it feels pretty lonely having experienced this and really having no one to talk to about it. So, I'd like to share a few things about the old house of my grandfather's prehistory. The house, it was built around 200 years ago. As far as I know, there were often soldiers in World War II there, and a few often given shelter as well. One disappeared after a few days without a trace, and it was also an old restaurant. About 40 years later, my grandpa found an old cross in the garbage and decided to restore it. After a few weeks, strange things started happening too. Mary and Jesus pictures started to sway without wind or any human influence. The whole house was shaking without wind that day or similar, and in Bavaria, there are also no earthquakes really, but they also had loud noises in the basement. My grandfather then mounted the cross on a nearby tree, and since then it is always foggy around that tree. My grandmother had cancer and died of it, and... She had a phone in her room, which was only connected to the phone in the living room if she needed help. What I mean is that she could not call anyone else with it, and a few days later when she died, the phone rang in the living room with the number of my grandmother's phone. When you answered the phone, you could only hear breathing and then it would hang up. This was weird too because, well, first, there was no longer a connection to the phone downstairs. And secondly, the contract of the phone was terminated. My grandpa then died December of 2015. And now, 2023, I myself have already experienced, well, many things. The first story is that me and a buddy went at uh, about 11 o'clock at night to the house to get something. When we got to the kitchen, to get into the kitchen, you have to go from a hallway left through a door... We then closed the door behind us, and suddenly somebody knocked. We panicked, but still decided to open the door, but when we did, there was nothing there. Suddenly, though, there was another loud bang. We ran quickly back to the kitchen, and after a few minutes, we heard footsteps in front of the door. We then looked outside, but again, there was no one to be seen. We then heard someone from the hallway run toward us, but... There was no one there either. At that, we just left and we didn't come back that night. The second thing that happened was I and a colleague have met in the evening and we were chilling in the living room. The living room is directly connected to the kitchen. After a few minutes, we heard above us a, a loud bang and loud footsteps. My friend panicked and waited outside and I went upstairs alone to look around and I looked but there was no one up there. On another occasion, once, a friend and me decided to set up two cameras in the hallway. At the end of the hallway, there goes a, a sort of door straight into the stall, and on the right to a stair to the bedrooms, and there's an attic too. And my buddy pointed his camera towards the stairs and to the beginning of the hallway. I pointed my camera from the beginning of the hallway towards the end, and when we went to get both phones, both phones were on the floor with the camera pointing towards the ceiling. Both videos were cut off at the exact same time and both fell to the floor at the exact same time. That seems almost impossibly unlikely, so we're still scratching our heads over that one. Another thing that happened was me and a friend went to the house at night. We wanted to film on the second floor and at the top of the stairs there were three doors. One at the front, one to the left and one to the right. We went to the right floor and... At the door there is a chair to block this door so we got into the hallway where at the end right and left are open doors. We then went in and we discovered something really weird. When we looked at the recordings afterwards you could see in the left door a hand and a face. It was clear to see but we checked the rooms and there was no one there. We went back and forth a few times too. We went up the stairs, looked around, there was nothing there. Went back downstairs, looked at the live feed, and there was someone there. And finally, on another occasion, when my cousin and I were kids, we slept at my grandpa's house at one point. We went to the toilet at night when we suddenly heard very loud scratching on the front door. We then thought that we were pranking each other, but then it happened again at the same time, and 
We were talking and my mother had lived there about two months after the separation with my father in the house because it is her parents' house. And she said that after a few weeks she felt really uncomfortable, not welcome and always watched. She had a lot of sleep paralysis and also heard footsteps and loud noises like scratching on doors. She quickly moved out after this and she never came back. Honestly, I could go on because things happened again and again in this place. Lights going on and off, doors opening on their own, things lying on the floor that shouldn't be there, footsteps, voices, things moving. Most of the time, people that came over felt very uncomfortable in this place too. At each visit, strange things would always happen as well. I'm going to spend a few days in the house alone and I'm actually going to take a camera and try to film something. If I get anything, I'll be sure to post it here, and if you're interested, you can watch it. And what I'm hoping is that you can help me figure out what's going on here. And please let me know if someone has experienced similar things and what you did about it. Also, I'm sorry if this feels a bit unorthodox, this story. I'm actually German, and I tried my best to write this text in English, and hopefully it makes sense. In any case, like I said... I'm going to go back for a few days, and if I catch anything, well, I'll share it with you guys. I grew up on the top of this mountain that was mostly abandoned since the 60s when an old ski kill burnt down. There were two other full-time residents up at the top where we lived. The rest of the houses stood empty the majority of the time or were abandoned. The history of this mountain dates far back, hundreds of years ago in fact, before the colonization of Canada. There were two native communities at war here as well. One of them lived on the top of this mountain, one lived in the valley below. At the base of the mountain, the two communities were supposed to meet for battle. During the journey down, the valley tribe snuck up behind the mountain tribe and slaughtered all their women and children. When the mountain tribe returned home, they were apparently slaughtered too. On the entire mountainside, these sort of vining wild strawberries grow there as well, and it's said that they grow from the spilled blood of the mountain tribe. Many people have died on this mountain. When I was growing up, there were hundreds of old crosses littering the twists and turns up the mountain, and my father also later became one of those crosses. In a small meadow surrounded by trees sat a small cottage, no driveways and only an overgrown pathway to lead you to it. If you looked inside, their breakfast sat still, prepared, oatmeal and eggs untouched for years. The man that lived there was supposedly a fugitive who disappeared further into the mountains when the police came up and found him one day. We had these weird neighbours too who would come two weekends a month from the city with their daughter who was my age. They would bring friends over, get high, drunk, and naked, and get it on if you catch my drift in their yard or the forest. There was this eerie feeling that you had while in this mountain, which was aptly named Forbidden. I stood looking at my bedroom window at night, and I swear that I could see things moving in the forest below. We also had the highest concentration of mountain lions in the world, and I was often stalked home. One night, my mother woke to the sound of the sliding door opening and closing. She walked downstairs and my sister was standing there sleepwalking, whispering over and over, Here, kitty, kitty. My sister had never been a sleepwalker until this. My mother grabbed her, closed and locked the sliding door, then flicked on the lights. And there, right there on the deck, pacing back and forth, was a cougar. My father also became a violent sleepwalker while living up there. He would have screaming matches with the wall, sometimes ended up throwing items around. This wasn't something that he did until the last few years of his life. My father was a skilled driver and had driven up this mountain and many narrower, steeper logging roads around the area many times. And a few months before the accident, I started having waking nightmares of my father's death. Sometimes telling me that he was going to die and... I remember waking up frequently and looking out the window into the forest during this period and feeling like, I don't know, like something was communicating with me that he was about to die. 
He kissed me goodnight one night and went out the door to go to town with his friends. They left in separate vehicles, him first, and from the accounts of what happened, it was a, a freak accident. They were driving below speed limit down a straight stretch nearing a cliff or a corner when my dad's truck suddenly just lost traction and started skidding sideways towards the cliff. My dad apparently opened the truck door and jumped out and the truck suddenly veered the other way and flipped straight onto him on the ground. Something that really physically shouldn't have actually happened or been possible even. It crushed almost every bone in his body and he survived for eight days in hospital after being airlifted. The day that he died though, I knew again. I knew that he was dead and it was like this feeling that something was communicating this to me. I didn't need to be told, I was so sure of this feeling that I collapsed onto the ground the second that I got this feeling and started screaming that he's dead isn't he, he's dead, just over and over again. I was eight at the time and I had never experienced death before but that feeling I'll never forget. There's a lot more too that went on up there to a lot of different people over the years. It's known locally as a haunted and weird place, nothing good ever really happened there. People do weird and crazy stuff out of character things there too, commit heinous crimes, die or just lose their minds apparently. We moved when I was nine and after I moved I never felt that feeling again anywhere else. That feeling of something insidious just all around you all the time. I've only been up there a handful of times since then and every time I have been up there that feeling always returns. So yesterday I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area too. For some background, the last time that we went, it was about a year ago, a car drove by and screamed nice butt at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location as well. Due to the lake's reputation, I had made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4pm without him. So, with that said, this is what happened. My 12-year-old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up to our favorite fishing spot. A small pond on the opposite side of the road is the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if we were fishing in the pond. I replied that yeah we had just gotten started but nothing yet but that we had caught fish in the pond on plenty of other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. Maybe about 15 minutes later another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son and Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky and I could tell that we weren't going to have any luck that day. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him that it's no problem and we were simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mum taking her kid fishing how you don't see that very often, etc. I get this a lot, so I'm pretty used to it to be honest. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation though, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels a bit strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault sometimes, so I answer his question. I tell him that I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25? He tells me though that he's 38 and I'm too kind and I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers so they always guess me well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. Turns out he lives there too and starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house or something. 
I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program, but it was a weird flex, but okay, man, whatever. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle, and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take the hints and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now, my alarm bells are definitely blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typically dad thing with my kid. Now, he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite, even when you're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes that he'll see that I'm not some meek, submissive woman who's going to just agree with him. I mean, after all, I'm a, a tatted-up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes that he'd just leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated... I tell him, oh well, you wouldn't like me at all then. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean it's okay to be loud I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know? I say, my man doesn't tell me anything, I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth though, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, Yeah, say that again, honey. And this distracted the creep just long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe though. Unbeknownst to Creepazoid, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks. But at least they're on the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice, nothing. And I mean, of all the times for my car to act up, why on earth did it choose then? Panic has set in now, and as I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life, and I peel out of there as quickly as I can. Only then do I let my composure crumble, and... I have a long talk with my son about what had just happened. I made a new deal with my dad that day, to never go to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. This happened around three years ago, and thinking about it, it still makes me feel really uneasy. I live in a rural area surrounded by a nature conservation area. There are many nice paths here and it's great and peaceful and a quiet place to go for walks, ride bikes, etc. And on this day, I decided to take my dog for a walk there in the evening. I didn't want to go that far that day and for some reason I decided to leave my phone at home, even though I usually take it with me just in case. Everything was going well and, as usual, I barely met anyone on there but at some point I got to my favorite spot a wooded area there's a field behind it and I planned on walking all the way to the end then I wanted to turn around and take the same way home as I continued walking after I made it through the wooded area my dog started acting a bit strange she kept looking back and didn't seem to want to go on I thought that she spotted a deer or maybe a rabbit and wasn't concerned I didn't look around right away, but then she let out a sort of little growl or bark. I had really never heard her do that before. I turn around and sure enough, there is a man standing on the edge of the wooded area or field, like maybe 10 meters next to the path. He was fully clothed and didn't move and he was just staring at us. My heart instantly was pounding. And no matter where I would go, I would still be in a secluded area for a while. I didn't think and just started walking quickly towards the end of the field. My dog still wasn't having it. 
when I turned around after getting a bit further away, he had also moved. Now he was standing on the field, still staring intensely. That was when I really knew that we had to get out of here. I didn't look back until we got to the end of the field. Because of some of the trees, my view was a bit obstructed, but I couldn't see him and my dog seemed a bit calmer now. Obviously, I really didn't want to stop for more than a few seconds, though. From there on, I decided to take the one path that would take me to some part of my town the quickest. We literally ran, and I was really relieved when we made it back. Back to civilization, that is. Now, I still have no idea what this guy's intentions were. I will say that just appearing out of nowhere like that is strange. And the way that he just followed us and watched us, standing still like that, I don't know. He was acting strangely and something just told me that something was wrong. I'm just really proud of my dog for alerting me because if they hadn't, I really don't know what would have happened. About eight years ago, my friends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Urbexing, that is. Definitely not the smartest idea, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. But anyway, this one night, we met a guy called Todd. Todd was an odd guy from the beginning. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point, a very interesting place in West Virginia. You should look it up if you're into ghost and haunted history. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area while us girls went ahead to explore, which was a red flag. I was convinced at the time that he was about to try and steal my car, but we went into the abandoned hospital and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. Scared us really badly. We let out a slight scream, in fact. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum. It's right next to the hospital. And that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, how much fun would that be? Well, we continued to explore and Todd just sort of hung out in the background. We eventually left and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas, so I started to drive to the nearest gas station. And maybe about two minutes up the winding road, I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders. As I'm driving, mind you, I kept leaning forward to give him the hint that I was not interested. As he's massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out, how we never know who is getting in the car and how they might hurt us, etc. He started laughing again and I will never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders as he said, maybe that person's in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and I instantly demanded that he get out of the car. He did and I just left him there. We got back home eventually and my friend went on to plenty of fish to block him but he had already blocked her or deleted his account. We never did hear from him again but we definitely stopped inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. So I work graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. I can't say the company for obvious reasons, but I've been on this side for two weeks, this being the second. Basically every hour I make rounds across a giant recycling yard covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. Now, during my shift I scan various checkpoints and ensure that nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grass or bushy sort of terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of a warehouse far across. This is to ensure that it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2K lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. And well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. 
I took the picture of the warehouse and submitted it, when all of a sudden I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. My hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I froze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse, I slowly turn around and point my flashlight behind me. And I kid you not, about 10 yards away, I see a, a skinny old wrinkled white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western style cowboy fedora on. He was bare skin under the overalls too. Now, I'm a 6 foot, 220 pound guy, but I screamed at this at a pitch that was honestly quite embarrassing. Accidentally, I dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are thin, tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. And all I hear is a quick pace, a shuffling, a clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. Once the metal crunching footsteps are within about five feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within about three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grabbed my flashlight from the ground and pointed to the sound. But the old man was gone, past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. When they arrived, that old man was long gone though. I believe maybe he was just there to watch the active trains move across. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still there in fact, I, I took a photo of it. More as a memento if anything. I am now in the office, honestly still a bit terrified and alone. I have to finish my shift tonight and tomorrow do another 11 hour graveyard shift. I won't quit as I honestly need the money, but I just wanted to get this off my chest. I randomly recall this memory at times, and I am so glad that my parents taught us not to trust strangers, and I'm even more thankful for my sister actually listening. So back in the 90s, my two siblings and I were walking from our house towards our bus stop to go to school. For context, I was seven, my brother was eight, and my sister was almost 11. It was a foggy morning and the walk was almost too quiet. We were the only ones in line of sight. We were a few streets away from the bus stop when a small white sedan pulled up next to us, slowly matching our pace. We looked over slightly confused and curious at a white woman with long curly brown hair in the driver's seat. She was staring at us intently. She was probably around 35 to 40 from the looks of her. This continued for a few seconds before she rolled down her window and said, hey kids, heading to school? She had this weird smile though and eyes that looked like they were looking through us. We nodded as it was obvious with our backpacks. She coaxed us with a wave why don't you three hop in? I can take you to school. I, of course, being seven and lazy, was all about a free ride. Sure, I said, smiling. My sister grabbed my arm tightly, so tightly that it hurt me. No thanks, my sister said sternly. The woman's smile seemed to fade and reappear in a fraction of a second. Oh, it's fine, really. You don't have to walk. I can take you quickly, she said, trying to sound kind. That's when I felt the hairs on my neck stand up. No, my sister said, even more stern now. My brother looked scared right now, and I was confused and alarmed at this facial expression that I'd never seen on him before. The woman then turned the wheel and pulled closer to the curb toward us. We all stopped in our tracks out of fear. Get in the car, she said, as she stopped the car. Her smile vanished and was replaced by a toothy sneer. She was close enough that I could see her dark brown pits for eyes, and I swear that she just glared at us with what looked like pure evil. That was it. My sister picked me up and yelled to my brother to run. I don't know how to, but all of a sudden she just had this Hulk-like strength. She and my brother started sprinting as fast as they could down the sidewalk. I clutched my sister tightly, screaming. They almost fell twice in the process, 
Thankfully, the car never turned around, and instead it sped forward and turned down the street. They didn't stop running until we made it home. We locked the door, and we were all sobbing. My mum and father both were working, so we couldn't contact them until they came home. But we only had landlines back then, and pages were only for adults. And that's basically it. If it wasn't for my sister, I'm pretty convinced that I would have been kidnapped that day. I guess the case in point here is that you should teach your kids to never trust strangers. Because apparently, I didn't listen. My mum lives in Ohio at the top of a hill on a country road. And one day, my son, aged eight at the time, was riding his scooter up and down the road. Something he wasn't actually allowed to do for safety reasons, but anyway... This country road has woods on both sides, but they aren't particularly dense on either side, and fields and a utility crossing splits the roadside woods from the bigger sections of the forest. Now, he suddenly comes running up the hill, white as a ghost, teary-eyed, and says that he saw something scary in the woods. He's almost inconsolable at this point. He finally gets calmed down and we ask him what he saw, and he says that it was kind of like a stick figure but thicker. It was all black but had no facial features and looked just like the man on the bathroom signs. Of course, we went to check it out. He took us to a specific area, pointed out exactly where it was, even showed us how much taller it was than a dead tree in the area, roughly seven feet tall. But he was physically shaking the whole time that he was showing us and talking about it, which I'd never seen that happen to him before. We told him that it was probably a warning to stay out of the road, but I don't know. What could it have been? Has anyone ever seen anything like this before? Also, to give a, a little bit more detail, this didn't happen recently. My son is 11 now, but he's pretty familiar with Slenderman, Bigfoot, I'd say even Shadow People. He likes scary stuff. So I feel like if it was any of those, he would have called it that or even said it looked like one of those things. I've even asked him if it looked like a stick man and he says kind of, but it really looked just like the man on the bathroom signs. He still remembers it too and he's more curious about it than scared these days, but still, the fact that he swears by it, it definitely has me intrigued. This happened about 15 years ago now. So my buddies and I went fish camping at a pretty remote lake off of a 4x4 trail, about two hours from home. There were four of us, all men with me being the smallest at 195 pounds. The camping spot has great fishing as it has a nice deep spot with lots of trout right next to it. But the campground itself, it's rough. It is on the side of a steep hill with barely enough room for tents and a small ring fire. It is accessible by a rough steep winding 100 yard trail from where you park your 4x4 above the camp. But we had a great day drinking beers and catching our limits on some nice sized trout. After it got dark we made a small fire and we just sort of messed around the whole night. It was a great time but suddenly... There was someone shining a blinding light in our eyes from about maybe 10 to 20 yards away. We didn't hear this person approach at all. This person announced themselves as the sheriff. One of my friends asked, are you so-and-so, our county sheriff? The stranger didn't respond to the question though. Instead, he shined a light in each of our faces and said, you have a good night, then just walked off. We sort of sat there dumbfounded asking each other, what the heck was that? And after a minute or two, curiosity eventually got the better of me, so I lit up this person with my stupidly powerful flashlight. He was about 50 to 60 yards away at this point, right before a crest and bend off the trail, right before he was out of sight. And we all saw it. It was just some dude in a flannel shirt and jeans. I said, that is not a sheriff. He must have heard me too, as you could see him start moving quickly for a second before he was out of sight. A few moments later, we heard an engine start, and that was that. 
It was pretty strange that we didn't hear the vehicle earlier, but I attribute that to being drunk and loud, I suppose. But what makes this kind of scary is, what if it wasn't four big dudes that he approached? What if it was a single person or even a couple? What did he intend to do? Should we have chased after this person? Well, that's debatable, I guess, but should we have reported this to the actual sheriff's department? Absolutely. But sadly and stupidly, we never did. So, this happened when I was about 11. I'm female. I had a friend over at my dad's house for the first time, 12 and female, and we were having a lot of fun that day. My dad went out into the front yard to take a phone call or something, I think. At this time, it must have been around 10.30 at night, and we were hyped up off of a Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, and were so hyper that we went outside with my dad. We mainly stayed in the front yard until we decided that we wanted to go inside. Me and my friend jumped my back fence because we were right next to it. For context too, I had a pit bull and a very large German shepherd who were also in my backyard. Me and my friend, we went up to the second floor and were playing with makeup. Maybe about 30 minutes later, we went back downstairs because I heard my dogs barking and I decided to let them in. The dogs had their own fenced off area in the backyard to not interfere with the garden. My friend pointed out that my dad was still out on the front porch, which, okay, cool, whatever. I went to my back door to open it and I saw a man crouching by the back gate, staring at my back door. He was next to the side of the gate that we had previously jumped. I asked my friend to stay there and make sure the man stayed there too and I was going to check if my dad was still on the front porch, and he was. For whatever reason, I never did tell my dad that this man was in our backyard. Instead, me and my friends watched him out there for about 20 minutes. After these 20 minutes, he moved across the street, crouched next to a car for 5 minutes, then comes back to the gate. I decided that it was unsafe for my dogs to still be out in the yard, so I turned on the light to help me see clearer and let the dog's gate open. After I let my dogs in, this guy is still crouched and not moving a bit. Ten more minutes, which seemed like a long time when you're going through it, pass by, and the man is still there but stands up. After seeing this man stand up, I realized that he is holding something. It looked a lot like a metal pipe. At that, I locked the door and me and my friend ran across the house to the front door to tell my dad to come inside. I never gave him an explanation as to why, but I'm guessing that he saw the urgency in my face or voice and he listened because he came in pretty quickly. After that, we looked outside, but by that point, the man was gone. I still think back to that day and I often wonder if, when we jumped the fence, if he saw us and, I don't know, something tells me that maybe he was hoping that we would jump that fence again. I don't usually share this, but there's something that's been weighing heavily on my mind and I just feel the need to share it. It happened when I was just 13 years old and it's an incident that still remains a bit hazy in my memory, but I'll try to recall it as best as I can. So, the amusement park, the only renowned one in our state, had recently opened its gates as the seasons transitioned into summer. For privacy reasons, I won't disclose the park's name or the ride where this unsettling event occurred, but typically I visited the park once or twice a year with my friends, family, and occasionally my parents as well. We would roam around, indulge in tasty treats, and experience the thrill of the rides, just regular kid stuff. However, this particular visit was destined to make me swear off amusement parks pretty much for the rest of my days. It was a chilly night, that mix of cold and warm from all of the stuff around you. However, the sky remained clear, which was all the confirmation that my friends, Nick and Caden, and I needed to ask our parents if we could go. Miraculously, 
They all agreed and in no time we found ourselves being dropped off at the park's entrance, brimming with excitement, ready to immerse ourselves in the vibrant, thrilling attractions. Among them, there was one ride that stood out as my personal favorite, and I'm certain that my friends felt the same way too. Housed inside of a dome-shaped building, this exhilarating ride dazzled us with a whirlwind of spinning lights and adrenaline pumping speeds. It seemed like the perfect choice. Well, except for one thing, the dreaded line. Not only was it a claustrophobic person's worst nightmare, but it almost always guaranteed an agonizing wait of at least an hour. And on that particular occasion, the line stretched so far back that it reached one of the neighboring rides, about a hundred yards away. Seeing this, we all let out exasperated sighs, realizing that we had no choice but to endure the line before we could move on. We figured that we might as well get it out of the way early. As the line snaked its way forward, we noticed that on the left side, where the line extended towards the forest, there were shrubs and bushes. My friends and I, we didn't really pay much attention to them at first, which is why we failed to notice something peculiar until we reached the large sign bearing the ride's name. It was Caden who first spoke up, excitement laced with a, a hint of concern evident in his voice. Hey, did you guys see that? He exclaimed, pointing in the direction of the forest. No? What are you talking about? Nick replied, glancing over at the bushes. Curiosity peaked. I looked in the same direction. And there, crouched down among the foliage, was a person wearing a, a Jason mask. Initially, we just found it amusing, thinking that it was a part of some Halloween-themed event or partly that the amusement park occasionally hosted in October. However, it was July, a fact that should have raised more suspicion, in hindsight, I guess. Whether it was ignorance or just us being naive kids, we just chuckled, assuming that it was just some kid playing a harmless prank. Our attention quickly returned to the ride, and we dismissed the incident as an inconsequential oddity. In the end, we endured the line for a grueling two hours, and despite the relatively brief five-minute ride itself, it was undeniably worth the wait. Afterward, we decided to grab a bite to eat and enjoy a few more attractions. Time flew by, and before we knew it, it was time to head back to the parking lot where our parents would be waiting. Unlike other kids who would typically complain, we welcomed the idea of leaving as exhaustion started to creep in. Amusement parks can be quite demanding like that, and with two hours in line, that seemed to do the trick. Navigating through the throngs of people also making their way towards the exit, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, a glimpse of that very same Jason mask. This time, I managed to catch a glimpse of the full figure behind it. The person, whoever they were, was massive, towering at least six foot six with a, a build reminiscent of a freight train. This man was a behemoth and it became glaringly evident that it wasn't just some kid playing a childish prank anymore. Subtly urging my friends to quicken their pace, we hustled toward the exit. As we reached the dark expanse of the parking lot, I finally gathered the courage to share what I had seen. I told them what I saw and how big this guy was, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and disbelief. Yeah, right, Nick responded, who was always the skeptic, especially when it came to this sort of stuff. Caden, however, remained silent, his gaze fixated on the park behind us, an uneasiness apparent in his eyes. No, seriously, I insisted, my voice growing more urgent as Nick and I engaged in a brief back and forth. Caden's next words cut through our heated exchange, causing us to pause and snap our heads back in the direction of the park. Little did I know that his revelation would unleash an unprecedented terror, leaving a mark on my childhood memories. Guys, look, Caden said, his voice tinged with terror as he began sprinting toward the parking lot. At first, all I could see were the masses of people flooding out of the park. I didn't understand what had spooked him so profoundly, and Nick appeared equally confused. But then, I saw it. The Jason mask once again. 
This time, the significance of its presence registered in our minds, and we just bolted in sheer panic. The colossal figure adorned with the mask was hurtling toward us though at an alarming speed and seemed to be clutching something in his hand, a mysterious cloth that I never really had the chance to examine closely, so I really don't know what it was. But we ran. We ran as if our lives depended on it, eventually catching up to Caden in the vast expanse of the parking lot. Together, we gasped for breath, scanning our surroundings in a frenzied state, until we spotted my parents' car. Without wasting a second, we scrambled inside, screaming at them to floor it. Although they wore expressions of bewilderment and concern, my dad pressed down on the accelerator, propelling us away from that nightmare as swiftly as possible. Interrogation became the theme of our one-hour car drive back home, and it was Nick who mustered the courage to offer brief, one-word answers to our parents' relentless questions. In truth, all of us were still reeling from the shock, I guess, struggling to process the enormity of what had just occurred. To this day, I still remain baffled by the man's intentions. What did he actually want with us? Why did he single us out? Why did he do this with a ton of people around? And what horrors awaited us if he had managed to close the distance between us? I vowed never to return to that specific amusement park, although I visited others since then. Nevertheless, you can bet your bottom dollar that I always keep a vigilant eye, forever wary of lurking shadows because these days you just never know who might be hiding in the darkness waiting to pounce like that. So, I'm from Brownsville, Texas, and one night I was at my girlfriend's house. We were having a normal evening, watching a movie and relaxing in bed at around 9pm. And since nobody else was home, we were surprised when we heard a sort of robotic-like voice coming from outside the window. I checked, but I didn't see anything. This happened twice though, and then we heard a noise coming from the kitchen. My girlfriend had cats in the house at the time, so we thought that it might be them and we didn't pay much attention. However, the noises continued and they were louder the second time. We jokingly checked the living room and the kitchen, but found nothing unusual, so we just went back to bed. Suddenly though, we heard the noises again for the third time, and this time we decided to thoroughly check the entire house. However, we couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. The cats were also missing as if they were hiding. My girlfriend went back to her room and I followed her. Before entering the room, I had a strange feeling though and decided to look out into the hallway. It was dark and I really couldn't see much, but suddenly I heard a, a human whistle. Thinking that it was my girlfriend, I smiled and laughed a little. However, when I looked at her, she seemed genuinely terrified and asked me to close the door. I locked it as she requested. In the end, we suspected that someone had entered the house and I was ready to call 911. However, my girlfriend insisted that I shouldn't. Instead, we decided to run out of the house. I locked the bottom lock of the door from the inside and I just went straight to my car. I was terrified and shaking and I wanted to call my dad and ask him to bring a gun, but my girlfriend convinced me not to. Instead, I called my friends and asked them to come with a baseball bat. We waited outside to see if anyone would come out of the house, but nobody ever did. I told my friends that we should go inside and confront the burglar with the bats that they brought. However, when I tried to open the door, I realized all of a sudden that it was locked. It was then that I remembered locking it before leaving, so we decided to go to the restaurant instead and get the keys from my girlfriend's mum. I asked my friends to stay outside and call the police if they saw anyone. When we returned, we positioned ourselves behind the door ready to open it. I unlocked the bottom lock and turned the knob, but to my surprise and fear, the top lock that required a key to lock was also locked. We didn't have the key when we originally ran out, and... This confirmed to me that somebody must be inside. I unlocked the top lock using the keys that we had and 
We quickly entered the house expecting to find somebody inside. However, after searching the entire house, and I mean, we checked all the windows, doors, everything. Everything just seemed untouched and locked. Since then, my friends and I have been unable to explain what actually happened that day. The top lock, which needed a key to be locked, was locked when we returned, even though we didn't have the key to begin with. Moreover, we still can't explain the human whistling sound that my girlfriend and I heard, and the whistling had a sort of mocking tone to it. When her mum got home, we told her what happened and she told us that morning that she heard my girl laughing loud while the TV was on and she told her girlfriend, Natalie is laughing so loud, I haven't heard her laugh like that in a long time. But my girl was not home that morning. She had slept over at a friend's house. In any case, a few months later, my girlfriend's mum was preparing to move out of that house. She was doing some final checks and making sure all the doors were locked. However, the next day when she went back to the house, she noticed that the back doors were wide open. This seemed strange to her, so she locked the doors again and turned in the keys. A few days later, the realtor who had the keys called my girlfriend's mum and asked if she had entered the house again and opened the back doors. She denied it, explaining that she didn't have the keys anymore. The realtor informed her, though, that the previous day... When they went to check the house, the back doors were wide open and they had definitely originally closed and locked them. But when they returned the next day, the doors, they were wide open once again. I, a 23 year old female, was recently in Africa on vacation with my family we stayed two nights at a desert camp in the Sahara. The first night, my sister and I, we were talking and hanging out with the guys who worked there, who were all probably around maybe ages 20 to 35. But they seemed friendly and harmless for the most part. I noticed at the campfire that night that one of the guys started paying more attention to me and I felt a little bit uncomfortable, but I figured that it was just a language barrier or something. So... Out in the desert, you can see the stars really well out there, and even the Milky Way on clear nights, but you have to wait for the moon to go down, which is at around 2am. I guess it's a normal thing for the guys to come around to the tents, which are luxury tents furnished with beds, lights, a toilet, and shower as well as a, a lock on the doors, so definitely not normal camping. They often knock on the door to see if you're awake and want to come out to look at the stars at night. My sister and I... We were sharing a tent, my parents in a separate one across the walkway. The first night at around midnight, I told my sister that I was too tired to go out because I was falling asleep, so she left to look at the stars without me, and I didn't lock the door because I didn't want her to get locked out if I fell asleep. Fast forward about an hour and I'm on my side asleep when I wake up suddenly to see a head peeking in from the tent door. I thought that it was my sister, so... I groggily asked her, what are you doing? Because it was just really weird the way that she was just standing there. I start to wake up a bit more and I then realize that it's this guy from the campfire's head peeking in my room while I'm asleep. Now, I know that it could have been a simple misunderstanding, but I felt totally violated with my privacy, especially because we were on their territory in the middle of the desert. Like... I'm not kidding, we had to take a 30 minute truck ride into the dunes to get here. Harmless mistake or not, I was in fight or flight at that moment. He literally woke me up with a panic attack so I went to the door and told him that I was tired. He kept trying to get me to come out to the dunes with a blanket, the classic male move right, but I just kept saying no, I, I didn't feel well and was tired, which was true. At this moment too, I really don't know where my sister is. I don't know where my family is. I'm disoriented like anything and all I know is that this man is standing in front of me and was literally just watching me sleep. I don't know how long he was there for. It could have been a literal second or it could have been, well, a lot longer than that. But either way, I was high-key horrified. 
I told him again no and said that I'd go look at the stars tomorrow night. He told me that he wouldn't be at the camp the next night and that's why he wanted to go out tonight, but I just wouldn't budge. Once he realized that I wasn't going to come outside, he asked if he could have my number and I told him no, I have a boyfriend. I don't, but it seemed the only way that this man would respect my disinterest was by knowing that there was another man in the picture. After I said that, he asked me for my first name and I gave it to him because I thought that it wouldn't do any harm. And then I said goodnight and I locked the door this time. I went right to the bathroom after this and while I was on the toilet, I heard him come back and start calling my name from outside the tent, but I just stayed quiet and I didn't say anything. I finished in the bathroom and I lay back down in bed. Still trying to calm down from what had just happened because my heart was racing. I heard him come back again calling my name. I laid in bed as still as I could and I didn't say anything. I tried texting my dad but he was not answering and I didn't feel comfortable leaving the tent at that point. Finally though my sister came back and my dad was with her so I told them what had just happened and they were confused and thought that it was weird and, and that was kind of it. The next day I brought it up at breakfast again and my sister and dad basically told me that I was just being dramatic and that I should just stop talking about it already because it wasn't that big of a deal. My mum was the only one who was like, yeah, that's really not okay. And the second night my sister and I were both out under the stars talking to the guys and relaxing Keep in mind, it's very dark out here and you can't see any faces. So, I was having a normal convo with this one guy, couldn't see him and all is well. And after a while, he asks me if I remember him and I'm like, well, no, I, I really can't see you. He's like, oh, shine a light. So I do and wouldn't you know it, it's the same guy from my tent. I really wasn't expecting him to be the dude in front of me because he had told me that he wouldn't be there that night. Which leads me to believe that he picked up a shift just to see me, but I really couldn't be sure. Surprisingly, he was fine that night and respected my boundaries, so I didn't say anything to the guys who ran the camp. I was planning on doing so if he did anything remotely uncomfortable, but he didn't. The next morning, we left the area and... A few days later, I start getting message requests on Instagram. Would you believe that somehow this guy found me? I mean, I tagged the entire desert. And you're telling me that he found me based on my name and a location? Not even a specific location, but an entire desert? And my name is not unique by any means either. Anyway... He messages me and although I'm creeped out a bit, I'm also thinking, okay, well, now he's harmless. I might as well see what he says. And he says, you know, I'm really so happy to find your account. I was looking for you all the time, which I found very creepy to even say to someone. But again, I don't know. It could just be a cultural difference, but who knows? I didn't answer and he messaged me again a few days later saying, hey, how are you? But again, I didn't answer. But why I bring this up is I'm curious what you guys think about this and if I really was just overreacting or if you think my literal gut feeling was right. He seemed to be harmless around other people in the end, but I don't know. The way that his head just popped in my tent at night when nobody else was around and I was the only one there... It was weird, to say the least. This has been going on for a couple of years now, but it hasn't gotten to me until now. I work as a paddling coach in Ottawa, Canada. I coach sprint kayak and canoe, dragon boat, stand-up paddleboard, and an assortment of other boats. I work year-round, but when the water opens up, I work out of a camp 10 minutes outside of the city. The club is surrounded by deep woods and several other camps. The plot of the land next to where I work is owned by the YMCA and used for a summer camp, but the camp only takes about a quarter of the area. The rest of the forest is filled with a, a spider web of deep wood trails that go on for like kilometers. 
I used to train my athletes on the trails, but for a couple of years now, we haven't been allowed to use them. Anytime we go on the trails now, a representative of the YMCA usually comes and kicks us off. So, it all started about two years ago. I was upriver, a ways coaching a dragon boat session. We were paddling alongside the shoreline owned by the YMCA, and just as we were taking a break, I heard the most chilling scream coming from the woods, not too far from the shore. It sounded like a woman's, but it sounded really off as though that she was struggling to get air or something. The whole boat stopped moving and stopped to listen. It was quiet for a long time until I asked if anyone had heard that. A dragon boat holds 22 people and just as I asked, everyone looked at me and nodded. People were quiet for a while to see if it would happen again. This first incident happened late in the summer so I assumed that it was just a camp kid screaming at a bug or something. I mean, it happens. When we didn't hear it again, we decided to continue the workout. Just as we got going, however, it happened again. Still, the same gargled sort of scream just beyond the tree line. And again, everyone in the boat stopped to listen. I wasn't 100% sure what to do, to be honest. I mean, I had never dealt with anything like this before. It was one of those things that you question constantly, not sure if what you heard was legit or not. I beached the dragon boat on shore just so that we could take a look. Everyone was guessing that the source of the scream could be more than beyond the tree line. A couple of guys and me took a look around but couldn't see anything. It was honestly a really chilling situation. We all eventually decided to call it a day though and head back. I assumed it was just a campground hiking the trails and it eventually left my mind. Flash forward to last summer though and I heard the screams again, only a handful of times though over the season. I can't say how many times but it couldn't have been more than three. Each time it would happen, me and whoever I was with could never find where it was coming from though. It was always the stretch of beach owned by the YMCA, never anywhere else. This all happened over different points of the summer and it was never just one part of the season. I want to say that this wasn't the only weird stuff that was going on at that club. Besides the odd disembodied screaming, myself and others would hear a few different sounds coming from the woods by the club. This would include a, a weird sort of rasping wind blowing through the forest, immediately followed by the sound of what can only be described as someone gutting a fish but really loudly. It's really hard to explain, but I want to do the sound justice because it just has chilled me to the bone every time that I've heard it. But the worst thing that I've experienced at work is somewhat too common nowadays. It usually happens when I have my younger training group with me. With this group, I coach mostly sprint canoe and sprint kayak and the group ranges in age from the youngest being 12 to the oldest being 17. I train the kids after school and... Sometimes we go late to just before the sun sets. Sometimes I'm stuck closing up the club in the dark with the kids, which is when this usually happens too. From time to time when it's just on the cusp of being dark out, me and my athletes hear footsteps coming from the woods that surround us. They always just stop short of the tree line and it doesn't sound like someone running through the trails or anything, but as if someone is walking through the underbrush. Just as we hear it, me and the kids always fall silent and look to the exact same place. This usually prompts everyone to drop whatever they're doing and hightail it to the parking lot to drive off. Now, all of this would have been fine. I mean, I'm a pretty tough guy, I guess. I don't scare easy. At least I didn't think so. But a couple of days ago, something finally put me over the edge. You see, it's been an exceptionally warm spring in Canada, which has allowed me to start work on the water three to four weeks earlier than usual. I was out on the water with a dragon boat crew, and we were paddling up and down the range of beach owned by the YMCA. And again, it happened. Everyone stopped paddling and just sort of stared at the, the stretch of beach that we always do. But the scream sounded different now. Still female, but... The best way to describe it is really demonic. All of my hair stood on end. 
The whole boat laughed awkwardly, assuming that it was just a, a member of the club or a member of the YMCA hiking the old trails, but I, I didn't laugh. It hit me almost immediately. It couldn't have been a member of our club because I was the last booking of the night, and it couldn't have been any of the members of the YMCA because it was too early in the season. The, the YMCA camp hasn't been opened for the season yet. That was the other night, and quite honestly, I haven't decided what to do yet. The whole thing has put me on edge, and I haven't allowed myself to stay later than eight these last couple of days. I'm certainly not a usual on these sorts of uh, channels, I guess you could say, but I thought that I needed to get my story out there. It isn't just me either. I've talked to the other coaches at the club, and all of them have heard the screams. We all just don't know what to do about it, to be honest. The screams usually happen a couple of times a summer and usually in twos, so I'll try to get a video of it happening if I can and I'll share it with you guys. Anyway, thanks for listening and uh, uh, do wish me the best as I don't know what to do now. When I was 10, I was riding my bike home from a friend's house when I encountered something. I live far north and it was mid-December, so we were about halfway through the three-month blackout. It was dark 24 hours a day. It was late afternoon, but if it wasn't for the streetlights that lined every street, I wouldn't have been able to see a thing. I had to pedal slow because I was bundled up in not only my heavy clothes but also my windproof coveralls because we were pre-blizzard. I stopped halfway up the hill that led to my street to take a puff of my inhaler and rest my legs. After my breathing slowed, I was able to hear a, a panting sound behind me, I thought. I turned around expecting to see Petey the coyote hybrid stray that was basically owned by the entire town. He was super friendly and was known to check on children when they were outside on their own. But Petey wasn't there. Thinking that my hearing was still a, a little fuzzy due to an inner ear infection that I had just gotten over, I shrugged it off and dismounted my bike. It was easier to walk alongside it at this point, and as I was nearing my street, I felt a, a hot breath on the small bit of ankle that was exposed between my overalls and rolled down socks. Immediately, I stopped and looked around again. I was raised by a very superstitious family. My poor poor always says, if something seems to be a little off, then you're not perceptive enough. After a moment of surveying my surroundings, I saw a four-legged form sort of trotting up the street behind me. It was too small to be Petey, but too thin to be a wolf or a lost hunting dog, so I began moving again, realizing that this was not an animal that I could predict. I kept my eyes on it and walked slow, just in case it was a very malnourished wolf that was looking for something to eat. It was only when I turned slowly onto my street that the animal started walking quickly its movements were so strange though, and it made sort of grunting noises that almost sounded human, I guess. When it suddenly began running, I pushed my bike back towards it and dashed up the hill towards my house. Our street was essentially a dirt road that turned into our driveway. The dirt was muddy from melted snow, and I kept slipping. Rocks cut my hands from stopping myself from hitting the ground, and my tiny ankles kept rolling. At one point, I couldn't catch myself in time and ended up sliding a few feet downhill. That's when I felt a searing pain on the back of my left leg. I cried out and rolled over to kick the animal off of me. That was also when I got a good look at my attacker. It was definitely a canine of some kind, but strangely it didn't have any hair. Its skin looked like black metal under the flickering streetlight overhead. I didn't get a good full look at it though because I immediately began kicking at it with the leg that wasn't pinned by its paws and teeth. Two good strikes to its side had it whimpering and jumping back just enough for me to scramble to my feet and begin running again. I could feel blood rolling down my leg as my house came into view. I could still hear the dog growling as it sprinted after me. 
I screamed from my mums as I approached the front porch, praying that they were home and that their guns were nearby. Aga opened the door less than a moment after hearing my shouts. She says that all she saw was me half running, half crawling sort of up the driveway, and that was all it took for her to run outside in her pajamas and bare feet. She heard a, a sort of howling noise as she picked me up and ran back up the steps. When we got inside, just as Katie was running out of the den with her 50-year-old AR-7, the rifle only worked like 40% of the time, but it was the only weapon that wasn't locked up in their bedroom closet. I wrapped my arms and legs around Arga and buried my face in her neck, sobbing violently. She could feel the warm blood from my leg against her back and she immediately rushed into the kitchen to call Katie's mother, Mary. She was staying at my Aunt Gloria's house. She was a nurse and she would be better than any doctor or shaman in town. Grammary, which is what I called her at the time, could hear my cries in the receiver and immediately got moving. Gloria, like everyone else in my family, lived on the same property so it wouldn't take her long. Katie came in after about 10 minutes of scanning the perimeter of the house. She was soaked from the sleet that had started falling and her hands were freezing when she ran in and started examining my face and neck. By then, Arger had gotten me to sit on the large ironwood dining room table and they worked together to get the several layers of clothing removed from my stiff body. I was still in shock and couldn't really assist them in the painstaking process. Grammary and Gloria arrived just as they were getting me down to my long johns. Glory had called my Uncle Cal and Pawpaw before they left her house. I remember hearing this too and just feeling a, a relief unlike any other. In my mind, they were and still are the strongest men in the world. If something hurt me, they would make sure that it would never come here again. The four women though panicked when they saw the source of all the blood that I had lost. There were five large gashes, about five inches long, and each one being about half an inch wide. Luckily, Grammary essentially had everything that she needed to treat the wounds, but she was adamant about getting me a tetanus and rabies vaccine, ASAP. Cal and Paw Paw gathered a posse, and the large group combed the woods and streets of the town. There was a lockdown due to the possibility of this being a rabid animal. Everyone stayed inside for nearly 24 hours, until the men were able to confirm the coast was clear. Whatever had attacked me, it was gone now. Now, when I was finally cleaned up with a drain put in my wounds, Cal sat down beside me on my parents' bed and asked me to recall everything that happened leading up to the attack. He asked if I had remembered smelling salt water, if I remember seeing poor poor prints, fading on the asphalt or anything, if I remembered hearing chains rattling or stuff like this. Honestly, until he started asking me all of this, I didn't really entertain the idea that this was supernatural. I thought it was just a, a sickly wolf or a coyote who wanted to claim one more victim before going into the woods to die. Paw Paw drew up some sketches for me though and asked if any of them looked like what attacked me. When I pointed out the one that most resembled the hairless beast, he immediately kissed me and he hugged me close. My poor poor is a, a very stoic Inuit man who never physically showed affection, so this was really strange to say the least. My mums tell me that when I was a baby, he only held me a handful of times and it was always stiff. He loved me and they assured me of that, but he would never tell me as such. So when he pulled away from the embrace and stroked my hair with tears in his eyes, I became weirdly afraid. I remember asking him if I needed to go to the hospital and his small chuckle in response. Without a word, he left, leaving Arga to assure me that I wouldn't be crossing the pearly gates anytime soon. I learned later though that in the 1950s, Pawpaw had a friend that went by the name of Howdy. He was also Inuit and the two of them had basically grown up together. When they were both 15, Pawpaw had joined Howdy on a hunting trip about 100 miles north of our property. This took place during the blackout as well, and as they trekked through the thick brush of the tundra, Pawpaw could remember seeing Howdy about 5 feet ahead of him, but suddenly, he just wasn't there anymore. 
There was a howl, a scream, and a growl before the overgrowth to Pawpaw's right began to rustle violently. Before he could react, it just went completely silent. He found Howdy's body about 10 yards away from the path. He was mauled and mangled to the point of being pretty much unrecognizable, but Pawpaw knew that it was his buddy. It took him two days to carry Howdy back to his truck so that he could drive him home, and throughout the arduous hike, Pawpaw could see large paw prints in the mud ahead of him. Each time he drew closer, they would disappear, and when he was finally to the truck and setting Howdy up in the bed of it, he saw what he knew was responsible for ending his friend's life. A keelet, something he'd only read about, was pacing the edge of the trail watching Pawpaw with small but piercing eyes. Not unlike the legends of other black dogs, these are large and black, and in this case hairless, canines that were known to attack travelers and kill them. From the legends told in our village, it was rare to survive an encounter with one of these things, but those who did immediately went mad. As far as I know, I never went mad. Surprisingly too, my wound healed in practically no time, and the only thing that I had left of the encounter were horrific nightmares, a fear of the blackout, and a few scars. Aga maintains that despite a disturbing life on our property, the most traumatizing thing that she's ever experienced was watching me scramble helplessly up our muddy driveway. She says that the screams that tore through my throat were what she imagined perhaps a, a damned spirit would sound like. I truly feel like I'm just going insane. This has been occurring for months now and what began as slight anxiety is now intense paranoia. You see, every night I hear my cat outside my window crying. Not meowing, but crying. Cat owners will understand what I mean. The first night I walked outside without hesitation and called my cat. When that didn't work, I worried that his legs or paws may have been hurt, which would explain the crying, so I went and searched for him with my phone flashlight. That detail is important because, as you probably know, phone flashlights are not that bright. So when I saw something moving in the bushes, it was impossible to tell if it was my cat or not. What I do know is that when I gave up and chalked his behavior up to being a brat, because let's be real, what cat comes when they're called, right? And it's no stretch for him to whine for no reason. I walked back inside my house to find my cat curled up and sleeping on my couch. Now, there's just no way that he somehow got past me walking through the door without my knowledge. But still, I brushed it off because I suppose anything is possible, right? The next night it happened was about a week later, and by then I had forgotten about the first weird experience. Only when I looked to the foot of my bed and remembered my cat had been with me the entire time, it all of a sudden came rushing back. I'm the girl who makes fun of horror movie characters for being so stupid, so when I sort of walked outside in morbid curiosity, let me honestly tell you that I have never retrospectively hated myself more. I went to my window and the crying was so clear that it had to be coming from within a few feet, but I didn't see anything, which was strange because I definitely saw something the first night. It was around this time that the creepiness of it all really hit me and I all but ran back inside. I swore then that my cat had lost his nighttime privileges and would be indoors by sundown and I wouldn't be investigating this anymore, naively thinking that it would just go away. But it has just gotten way worse. That was months ago and the crying occurs almost nightly now. Barring a couple of nights of feline rebellion, I've been vigilant about keeping him indoors at night, so I know for a fact that whatever I'm hearing is definitely not my cat, but it sounds just like him and it's so realistic. Now, before you comment saying that it was another cat, 
don't bother. I know what my cat sounds like. I'm a proud cat mum and I can tell him apart from any neighborhood stray. I'm familiar with being cautious of baby cries outside your door at night because predators have been known to record them and bait women, essentially weaponizing their maternal instinct. But who does that with a cat? For that to work, not only would you have to know that I have a cat, but also somehow gain access to a recording of his crying and play it back for me every night right outside of my window and not be seen. So, hello nightmare, right? Has anyone else experienced something similar? How did you make it stop? Is this thing's goals just to rob me of sleep and peace of mind, or am I in danger here? Or is it finally time for me to suck up my pride and see somebody because I'm officially going insane? I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania with a dense forest in my backyard, as well as a creek and fresh water spring too. My brother and I would often play away our summers in the woods running around, but we both can attest to having some weird experiences. Nothing super overt, but just sort of your stereotypical chills or uneasy feeling as if you're being watched. However, when I was around 13 and my brother was 15, we went into the woods like we always did and at some point we sort of split off. I travelled about maybe a mile along the creek when I heard my brother call for me. There was no panic in his voice, it was super calm just as if he wanted to talk to me about something or if he found something cool, a rock or a critter or something. I called back asking what he wanted but his response was just my name again and again. I began to walk toward the direction of his voice deeper in the woods, away from the creek and into the brush. I continued calling out again, asking what he wanted, but his response was always just my name, in the same tone and pitch. Then, suddenly, someone grabbed my shoulder and when I turned, it was my brother. I asked him what he needed and he looked at me confused. You were calling me, so I came to find you, he said. I responded that he had been the one calling for me and I was walking to him. He said that he hadn't called for me at all at this point and I pointed to the direction that I had heard his voice and he responded that he had never even gone in that direction, keeping to the creek side like I had. I was inclined to believe him too as... I had heard his voice come from deep in the woods where there was thick brush filled with thorn bushes and not many walkable deer trails, and he had approached me from behind which was the direction of the creek. My brother and I decided that we were going to head in for the day after this experience and we avoided the woods for months after this too. It's by far the creepiest experience that I've ever had. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a, a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day and we made some hot dogs and beans. Then we stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars at night. Once it was dark, we hiked up to the top of a, a large boulder to sort of get a bit of a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. And we were pretty far out so there's no background noise or light from humans. And once your eyes adjusted, after maybe half an hour or so, we could see all the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. It's very dark out without the moon and that will be important later so keep it in mind. So... After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other one. We set up the tents right next to each other in the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark. I like sleeping in the dark though. However, at about maybe three or four in the morning... 
I wake up to a rustling noise outside of my tent. In my half sort of asleep days, I'm really not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent and it sounds like maybe an animal is pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll be over quickly. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside so I decide to just keep lying still and hope that it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility and then I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier in the day, there wasn't much flat space, so we placed our tents very close to each other. Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, all which was right near my head. So all along, it was my friend's feet moving around and there was no animal or person outside. That was a huge relief. However, the weird stuff doesn't stop there and... I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. You see, as I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing the rustling was just my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the walls of my tent. But that reminded me uh, sort of as a kid when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds could cast shadow that slowly draw across your ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me and... I thought it was just like when I was a kid, considering that I had just thought a, a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was completely dark and moonless, so what could that light have been? It was a, a very slow drawing light that had the shadows of the trees moving slowly across my tent walls for about 5 minutes. We were really far from civilization so there is no way that it was a car or flashlight from a midnight hiker because the light was so steady and slow moving. Could it have been a flare in the sky or a comet streaking across the dark starry sky? I suppose so but really I don't think it was that. I mean something that far away really doesn't seem to account for the strength in the shadows if you catch my drift. In any case, I still don't know what it could have been and I only ever realized it after that I had gotten home and left the campsite that that night was a really weird one. I grew up with my grandma and lived with her most of my life and her house always freaked me out because weird things happened. It's not like the house was old. No one had ever lived there previously and it wasn't the typical scary house that you think of when you think of a haunted house. I guess I have my theories but that's for another time I suppose. Anyways, everyone in my family who stayed there has their own stories of things that they've seen or heard including myself. Some examples of what I experienced were hearing footsteps outside my door in the middle of the night hearing someone in the master bathroom walking around and turning the sink on when I was the only one home. When I was young, I was sneaking downstairs to grab a snack and turned the corner to go downstairs and saw a little girl sitting on the big box that we had at the bottom of the stairs, seeing figures of people on the walls moving around. Honestly, the list goes on. These things happened throughout my life and were spaced out occurrences, so I tried to just ignore it all the best that I could. But... What I experienced when my grandma was dying were some of the most intense things that I have ever witnessed. So my grandma had breast cancer and eventually it spread throughout her body and she lost the battle. They put her on hospice and we set up her living room for her to stay in so we could take care of her. The last week of her life is when things started getting just really weird. For instance... I would be sitting on the couch next to her bed and see people in the corner of my eye walking past the doorway in the hallway, even when it was just me and her in the house. And when other people were there, they saw it too. 
There were times where she would be looking up to the ceiling or at the walls and smile like she was looking at someone that she knew. Another time my whole family was on the couch just being with her and the light in the room went out and my grandma smiled and said, it'll come back on. And right when she said that, it did. Now, while these occurrences were starting to happen frequently, it was just little things like that. But then the last few days of her life, she started declining more so we bought a baby monitor with a camera to watch her when we weren't in the room to make sure that she didn't try and leave the bed or something. She kept trying to do things on her own and would fall. Well, one night my sister and I were upstairs in her bedroom talking and we looked at the monitor screen and I instantly started crying from what I saw. It's hard to describe what we saw, but the only thing that comes close to what it looked like was a mix of a sort of a gremlin and golem. It felt so off though. We watched it almost crawl or jump onto her bed. She was asleep, but it seemed like she knew it was there because she made a movement with her hand like she was hitting it away and once she did that, it left. My sister went downstairs to check on her. She was still sleeping and nothing was there. It was one of the creepiest and weirdest things that I've ever seen in my life and even after six years, just the thought of it makes the hair on my arm stand up and my eyes begin to tear up too. It's not just because of how scary it looked, but because of the way it made me feel, I guess. Even through the monitor, you could almost like feel its presence and you could feel that it was not good, whatever it was. The next night, my sister and I were back up in her bedroom watching a movie and my sister looked at the monitor and studied it for a second and told me to take a look at it, which after what I had already witnessed, I was terrified to even look, but I did. And clear as day, you could see a head behind my grandma which looked like she looked at the time, sort of bold and sick and etc. So we took a picture of the monitor screen this time and we zoomed in to see what it was. We noticed above that head was my uncle's face. You could see his features and could easily recognize it was him if you knew him. He was my grandma's son who died a few years back from cancer as well. While I don't really believe in God and am not sure where I stand on the afterlife, even after all my experiences, it was a feeling of relief I guess seeing this after the horror I saw the night before. Almost like him saying, it's okay, I I've got her. I have no idea what the head was behind her. My sister thinks it could be her starting to leave her body. It did look like it was her just watching her body laying there. A couple of days later, she passed away too. For the next month, we stayed there to pack up her house and sell it. And while there were some weird occurrences from time to time, that was pretty normal for the house. And it seemed like all the insanity and the activity that occurred while she was dying had left with her. But... I'll never forget the things that I saw in that house during that time and even as I'm sharing all of this, I have goosebumps. I do have the picture that we took of the monitor. It's a pretty unsettling photo and shows my grandma too so I'm not sure if I'll post it unless I'm able to cover her for the sake of my own family but anyway, thanks for listening and uh, yeah, it was a crazy time. I'm currently living in my SUV right now and last night around 12am I parked in a Walmart parking lot to take some sleep. It was one of the worst days that I've had in a long time and I was absolutely exhausted so when I got into the back of my SUV I fell asleep right away unfortunately forgetting to lock my doors. I've uh, always been a very light sleeper to be honest, I'm thankful too that I am because somehow I woke up, turned around in my makeshift bed to face whoever was now sitting in my driver's seat of my car, looking directly at me. This is where the story somehow gets kind of funny, I guess, because I was so tired and in such a daze, 
All I did was continue to shake my head back and forth and say no, while reaching across this person's lap and opening the door for them and gesturing for them to leave. And thankfully, they got out. I hope whoever they were that they're okay, but quite honestly, the fact that somebody got in my car late at night like that, I don't know, I feel pretty lucky for some reason. So I, a 27-year-old female, was at the laundry mat today with my father, and one and a half-year-old too. To kill some time between loads, I took my extremely active tot outside where he couldn't destroy things. There was a gas station about maybe 30 yards next door, and there was a six-foot chain-link fence halfway between that separates the lots. The area directly next to the laundromat that connected to the fence though was a little bit grassy and sort of a sandy open area too with one large tree right in the center. My son runs outside and turns and starts running around in this area laughing and playing which is great. After about a minute though he starts sort of running up diagonally towards the fence in the direction of the gas station. I'm sort of laughing behind him watching his little legs go when all of a sudden I hear footsteps approach behind me so I turn and look and I kid you not it was like the movie Get Out. This man just straight knee to chest running straight towards my child with manic eyes. I bolted, scooped him up and darted back into the laundromat so quickly. I glanced back over my shoulder when I was taking off and the guy was now on his knees laughing and rolling around being really weird. I'm not sure if he was just mentally ill or maybe it was high or something but I was shaking so bad because I had no clue what his intentions really were. This was about seven years ago when I was a teenager working at a grocery store. It was towards the end of the night and I was on my break. It was dark out, which made this even creepier, to be honest. Like I said, I was on my break sitting on a bench outside behind the grocery store. But this area that I was in is basically like a back alley next to a train station railroad. It's always been sketchy, especially at night time. But I see this Asian lady walking with an African-American young girl. The girl is sobbing, and as they get closer, I swear that I hear the girl crying, help, help. This obviously sends shivers down my spine and my blood instantly ran cold. I called the cops and they actually did a good job. They called the train stations to see if they saw this lady getting off and warned them to look out for her. They also combed the entire store looking for this lady. Sadly though, she was never found. My boss was mad that I called the cops without coming to her first. But I still think about this and... It always just gives me the creeps. I mean, why were they walking in a, a sketchy area late at night like that? Why was the girl crying for help? I don't know. Something about the whole situation felt really weird and very sketchy. What do you guys think? So this... This was really weird. I went rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived too. It's a very secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up on my gear and on the rock bar. I grabbed a bag and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in I kept looking up at the forest I don't know why, but I just kept getting a, a really eerie feeling. Every now and again, I would hear a couple of thumps out there, but, you know, it's just nature, so I didn't think too much of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow, though. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? Ten minutes go by, and I'm walking further up the creek, and damn if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yeah, I definitely just heard a cat meow. That's really weird. But like, 
something seemed really off and I started to feel uneasy so I turned around and I started heading back to my site. Something about the meow just wasn't right. It wasn't a, a painful one but just like a, a matter of fact sort of meow if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back I definitely hear a meow this time and I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat but instantly feel cold and clammy and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded a lot like someone or something imitating a meow. I keep focused on getting back to my site and about five minutes later, another one. Here's where I realize that things are getting really weird. The meow always sounded the same distance from me no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reach my site and pull out my drinks and plop down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded and this time I knew with everything in me that it was definitely not a cat following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. And then, and then, another really long drawn out meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down into a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and was really starting to lose my head. I got my keys and mace out and put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later if I need to. And I nearly lost it, finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did, and I hightailed it out of there as quickly as I could. Now, the rational answer to this is that someone was just messing with me, but how did they get back there in the first place? It's like 200 acres of forest. I mean, really? I'm in North Alabama and there really just shouldn't be anyone out there. I don't know. What are your thoughts? It was the early 90s and I was 17 or 18. I had moved out of my parents' house not long before to not the safest of cities. I was a handful at the time and I was clashing heads a lot with my parents. I had a great job, for my age anyway, $16 an hour and the rent was low at $350 so I moved out. Anyways, my best friend and I would go for blunt rides around the city when we were bored. Back in the early 90s, the streets were pretty scenic with crackheads and corner boys. I stupidly had very little fear and we were used to it by this stage. I was driving and we were both pretty smoked out. She was also drinking some kind of liquor straight from the bottle as well. We had just gone through a yellow light on one of the main roads when I noticed the car behind us had a police light on the roof and was flashing their headlights at me. Oh man. My friend starts freaking out, shoving the bottle under her seat already almost in tears. I didn't think twice about it. Back then, there were undercovers everywhere. I pulled onto the side of the pretty busy street, hiding the blunt and watched the driver take the light off of his roof and start walking towards us. He tells me that he has seen us driving up and down the streets looking for drugs and demands our IDs. He's leaning in and close to my face, looking back and forth at both of us and sniffing the air. He was a really big guy too, kind of unkempt to be honest but we fish out our IDs and hand them to him. He tells us that we're in big trouble apparently. In my sort of rebellious dumb head, I'm thinking, what, what for? Well, we weren't looking for drugs, just sort of joyriding and smoking some weed. He goes back to his car. By then, my friend is in a puddle of tears. She was no angel either. She was pretty drunk and high and freaking out. But he finally comes back and tells us that he talked to his partner. There was another man in his car and his partner decided to take it easy on us. He said that he would let us go with a warning if we gave him all of our weed and went home. I remember quickly calculating the situation. Plain clothes, undercover car, just wants our weed. It just didn't add up. Just at that moment, an actual police car too was driving by on the other side of the street. The guy saw it too and stepped back a little. 
I just reacted and opened the door and went to the middle of the street waving my arms at the cop car. I remember the look on the guy's face like a confused court kid with nowhere to go. The cops were coming to a light and not going fast anyway. They stopped right there and I just started asking them before they could say anything, is this guy a real cop? They looked confused. The guy looked like he didn't know what to do. I was yelling to the real cops that this guy said that he was a cop and pulled us over. The guy started fast walking back to his car and partner. The cops left their car in the middle of the street and went after him and they got him. More cops showed up and my high is completely gone at this point. The fake cop's car is absolutely swarmed all of a sudden and I finally see them both being taken to a cop car in cuffs. The cop that originally stopped came back to my car with our IDs and explained to us that this wasn't the first time that these guys had pulled their fake cop act. Asked me if I was okay to drive home, took our information and said that they would be in touch. I was shaken but I guess more mad than anything. We went back to my apartment and well that was pretty much that. Now, for some time, I had a bit of a habit of checking out the police logs and court sentencing in the local paper, and I found the guy's court appearance, which also contained a mugshot and a short article about how many times he had done the same to other women. And the danger that we could have been in didn't really sink into my stupid teenage brain until I read that apparently he had stabbed two of those young women. I still remember his face and his name even. The court record said that he got a 20 year sentence for it as well. I wasn't a big fan of police back then but I thank God that they just happened to be driving by that day because if they hadn't, I really don't know what would have went down. So it's night time and just to preface, whatever happened, all of the windows in the house are closed except mine. Now, my brother said that he let both of my cats out a few minutes ago and there's no way or reason for him to lie about that. He's a bit of a night owl and always up all night so it's sort of kind of his duty to let them out every night or else they sort of keep everyone up. I was just sat in my bed listening to music and reading on my laptop door fully closed and the whole light on outside so I'd know if it was opened. But my cat loves to cuddle up any time of the day and sometimes likes to sit underneath my bed even. I always left his favorite blanket under there for him because of this too. And what I thought was my cat came up to my bed seemingly to jump up on it so without looking properly I started patting the bed and like sort of making a noise which is just something that I do for him to get up on. He's shaking side to side like he's going to jump up but he doesn't. And at this point I think that he looks really weird from the corner of my eye. I glance at him for a second and he does look super weird. Because I can't really see his face but at telling from the dark and the light from my laptop he looks really scary. Now I don't know how to describe what I was looking at but... It was this sort of hairless and really sickly pale grey coloured cat and not wrinkly but like shaped sort of like a bobcat. I don't know. It looked like bread dough but with legs for real. I thought that I was tripping out because it was so dark so I looked back at him and bent down to try and stroke him but he immediately jumped under my bed. Yes, jumped. Like ran so fast that it wasn't running. It was more like one motion I guess. This wasn't like the corner of my eye type of situation too. I glanced at him, thought he looks really weird, then looked back at him straight on and saw the same thing. It's not even like it could have been lighting either because he's a, a fluffy brown and black cat. So why would he look like that? It couldn't have been something on the floor either because I always keep my floor spotless. But after 10 minutes of sitting there terrified, I manned up, got off my bed, turned on the lamp and looked under, but when I did, it was entirely empty other than the blanket. Then I looked around all of the places a cat could hide in my room, but 
there was nothing. Everything that he could get in was closed and the door is too, so he couldn't have run out. It just really freaked me out. I don't know if I'm just going crazy, but at first I thought that it felt like him. Like his presence just felt like it was his, so I didn't think anything was wrong. Then I felt kind of ill when I got a glimpse. Am I just having a gas leak, seeing a ghost cat, or should I go and see the doctor for a diagnosis on schizophrenia? He has a dead twin brother, if that means anything, but he wasn't bald, nor did he like to cuddle. Only at night when he slept with me, but not in the room that I'm in now, so I don't know. I really don't know what to think about all of this. All I know is that I definitely saw something, and... It was not my cat. So I was 10 years old at the time and it was summer break after finishing 5th grade. It was maybe the 2nd or 3rd week of June. I don't really remember why but my mum had to go to a dinner with some of her co-workers from the daycare that she worked at one night. She left my older sister who was only 12 to watch over me but my older sister was more so there to make sure that the house doesn't burn down rather than watching over me, I guess. That night, my mum left for the dinner and she said that she would be right back. I remember that I was in the living room and my older sister was upstairs in her room. I was also downstairs with Fenrir, who was a black Newfoundland that I grew up with my entire life. Unfortunately, by the time that I was 10, he was showing his age... He couldn't really walk, run, or stand up like he used to. We would usually have to help him up and walk him outside to the backyard, which had a porch. The porch had a walkway that we had built so that Fenrir could walk down easier. We would also have to bring his food and water bowls over to him as he was always too tired to get up. So I'm watching TV in the living room with Fenrir lying down by the side of the couch when suddenly I hear this loud growling. I muted the TV, turned around, and saw Fenrir growling and snarling at something. He then started barking at something, and I looked over and saw that he was directing his attention at the back door that led to the backyard, but I didn't see anything as it was pitch black outside. Suddenly, he just stood up with seemingly little to no effort, which was weird for him, and was violently growling, snarling, and barking, but keep in mind, he hasn't been able to get up by himself in a while, so to just see him stand up like he was young again scared me a lot. I used to say that it was like as if Fenrir got possessed or something. Anyway, he was still directing his attention to the back door, but before I could react, he suddenly jogged over to the back door and got on his hind legs and started scratching on the glass that was on the door, still growling and barking. At first, I thought that a squirrel probably got up to the porch and came up to the back door or something. But then I remembered that he wasn't even this aggressive towards squirrels. What I mean is that when he would see one, when he was younger that is, he would bark and chase it, yes, but it was more so to sort of scare the squirrel off rather than actually hurt it. And to add to that, he was not an aggressive dog. He would always be really sweet to people and other pets. He was also usually calm, so to see him going feral like this actually really scared me. He sounded like he wanted to kill something, if that gives you an idea of how aggressive he was. In any case, I finally walked over to the back door where he was clawing at. I sort of pushed him away, surprised that he didn't snap at me, and I decided to put my face against the glass to peek out and see if anything was there, but I didn't see anything. All the while, Fenrir is still scratching, growling, barking, and now baring his teeth and drooling to my right. I then walked to the right, where there was a light switch that turned on the porch lights, and Fenrir went back into his spot, scratching and growling at whatever he was upset about. I flipped the light switch on, and the second that that happened, I saw a man dressed in all black, classic burglar outfit, with gloves, a ski mask, and everything. At first, he was seemingly looking into the back door with his face and hands pressed up against it. And when I turned on the lights, he got startled and took a few steps back. 
He then turned over to me and it was like time just froze. We were both frozen, just staring at each other for a few seconds. Me being only 10 and not really knowing what to do, I quickly reached out to the knob of one of the back doors, more specifically the door that Fenrir was still scratching at, and swung the door open. The guy tried to run, but Fenrir was right on top of him. The guy wasn't even able to get off the porch before he was latched onto. When I say latched onto as well, I mean really latched on. Fenrir had first bitten down on the guy's leg and then moved and was biting down on the guy's arm now. The guy tried to hit him off, but he was just not able to. I was just frozen, staring down at Fenrir, really biting down on this guy. To be honest, I was more scared of my own dog than the guy that was most likely trying to break in, since I'd never seen him be this aggressive in my entire life. I actually thought that Fenrir was just going to straight up kill this guy, but eventually the guy screams in agony, which I guess caused my sister to run downstairs to see what was going on. Not really sure why she didn't come downstairs when Fenrir was growling and barking the first time, but I digress. My older sister was freaking out and eventually called 911. She then told me to go to my bedroom, which was also upstairs, and so I did. I ran up to my bedroom and just stayed there, in shock of what I had just seen and the whole situation in general. A while later, the police showed up and my mum eventually showed up too. She burst through my bedroom and basically gave me the tightest bear hug that I would ever gotten from her. I remember that she was also crying, worried sick that I was hurt. While I was shaken up, I wasn't physically hurt though. But at one point, I finally go downstairs and I see my older sister talking to the police officer, while Fenra was lying down next to her with some blood on his face, much like Cujo. I remember thinking at the time, oh my goodness, Fenra just killed somebody. And then I also remembered that when I put my face up against the glass on one of the back doors to see what Fenra was so angry about, I most likely put my face directly when the guy still had his face up against it on the other side. So that means that I must have made direct eye contact with this guy before I turned the lights on without even knowing it. However, while the guy did lose a lot of blood, thankfully, or maybe not, I don't know, he didn't die. And to be honest, I don't really know what happened to the guy afterwards, other than that he had to have gotten arrested, obviously. And my mum was instantly looking into buying a new house after this and moving, and we all eventually did move when I was maybe 11 or 12. Unfortunately, before that, first... I had developed my intense fear of dealing with intruders, so much so that I couldn't look outside windows when it was pitch black outside for a while because I was afraid that I was just going to see a face right there. And second, a few months before we moved, we had to put Fenra down because he was just too old now. Needless to say though, that 2014 was the year that my childhood and innocence all died. I'm 18 years old now and I have since been able to look outside windows when it's dark outside now. But while I am still afraid of intruders, it's not really as bad as it used to be. When I move out, I'm definitely getting a big dog of my own though. I will forever be thankful for you, Fenra. Had it not been for you, who knows what that guy could have done to either me or my older sister. So my whole family is, uh, I guess you could say, in tune with some kind of spirituality or paranormal stuff. I really don't know what to call it, but whatever you want to name it. Both my parents and all my siblings, there are eight of us, have seen or heard or felt ghosts, demons or other dimensional beings, or whatever you want to call them. I have a handful of stories, both from my personal experiences and stories that my family has told me. This is my first time sharing this after I heard a couple of stories from others I was inspired to share my own. I'll probably eventually share more, but for now, let me tell you about these green hands that I saw when I was 8 years old. So I was scared of the dark until I was about 27. I'm 32 now. 
I was always a bit of a scared little boy because of all the stuff that I'd seen and heard, so I used to sleep with the light on when I was a kid. I shared a room with my older brother, but my bedtime was like 8pm and this was 11 or 12. For hours I would be too afraid to fall asleep and I would wait for him to come to bed so that I'd feel sort of safe closing my eyes knowing that he's with me, you know. Sometimes he just wouldn't come to sleep so I eventually fell asleep waiting for him with the light on. Whenever I closed my eyes I would be so scared of seeing something in front of me like a huge face or a monster or something like that when I opened them so I would pull the blankets over my head and tuck my feet in and sleep all walled up under the, the tight blankets and try to sleep. But because I was a bit of a fat kid, I would sweat on the pillow because it was so hot under there, breathing so hard. My brother would come home late at night sometimes and he would be super angry that the pillow would be so damp and the blankets and all that. So he made us use a bed sheet as a blanket since it was way thinner. For nights and nights I slept under the sheet and didn't sweat anymore. But one night I wasn't tired and I just couldn't go to sleep. I remember staring around the room and was just sort of talking to myself and imagining what I would do tomorrow at school and stuff like that. Just kid stuff. I remember this clear as day as well. I know it to be true, but I don't know. Who really knows about these things, right? Anyway, as I'm laying there on my back, I had the sheet tucked under my heels so the sheet was pulled tight and taut over my toes. It was a, a Mickey Mouse, a Goofy, and a Donald Duck sheet. I don't remember if I heard a noise or anything, but I was staring at my feet, and all of a sudden I saw these two huge green hands slowly creeping up from under the bed. It was the foot of the bed too, because there were no sides. And now, these hands were ugly, like straight up green like a goblin or an orc, Long nails, yellowish, bumpy, and each hand was like the size of two hands. They both together came up, hands open like they were going to high-five my feet or something, and I remember it was so slow too. I was completely paralyzed. I couldn't move, scream, or do anything but stare. It was so unreal. They crept, they grabbed the loose sheet under my feet and pulled it hard from under my heels and then slowly lifted the sheet over my feet. Now I can see my skin, I saw my feet exposed and they let go of the sheet right before they grabbed me and I just absolutely screamed. Like instant crying and tears and screaming. I jerked my feet back and saw them slowly slither sort of back under the bed with their hands still open. A good description of them actually is that they look sort of like they belong to that eyeball hand creature from Pan's Labyrinth, only green. In any case, I screamed for my mum and my stepdad while crying and with my knees curled up to my chest and I remember my parents took their sweet time to come to my aid too. I felt like I was sitting on my bed screaming for 30, 40, maybe 50 whole seconds. That's a long time as well for a little kid. So when my mum busted in to see what was wrong, I immediately jumped off the bed and ran into her arms crying, pointing at the end of the bed telling her, there's hands, there's green hands, I saw them. And she was like, what? What are you talking about? My stepdad came in and she told him what I had said and he was just as confused. He walked over, checked under the bed and found nothing of course. Just a, a backpack and a shirt and maybe a wrestling toy. Steve Austin, I think. But apart from that, nothing was there and he said that I must have just been dreaming. Now, I know for sure that I was not dreaming because this night I just couldn't sleep and I decided to just stay awake and wait for my brother to come home like I always did. I never pulled the sheet over my head too. That's how I slept every night. The sheet over my head and I can't see them and they can't see me kind of thing so I know that I wasn't dreaming, definitely not. So now I'm trembling, horrified, snotty nose, watery eyed, rambling kid and I begged my mum to let me sleep with my sisters. She said no, she said dad said no and it was just a dream, go back to sleep you'll be okay. But no, I am not sleeping on that bed or this room tonight. And 
and so I begged and begged and cried and squeezed her harder looking up at her pleading for my life it felt and eventually she said okay just tonight I slept with my sisters for like two weeks though because to heck with that but my mum is religious and we all went to church on Sundays and she just wanted us to pray and uh, that I would be safe but even still I just couldn't sleep in that room anymore unless I was with someone. No one knew what happened too. It was just a, a really weird night I guess. But my sisters knew something must have happened because we all saw some weird stuff in that house and other houses too so... That was just another thing to add to why we like to sleep with the lights on. After many months, I think I just forgot about what happened, I guess. I moved into my sister's room and we shared it. I really don't know what to say, but that I saw green hands. I felt them pull the sheet over my feet, and I know that I saw it. I don't know what they were or what they were connected to or who or nothing perhaps, it's scary for sure, but now as an adult, I really don't know what to think. It's really odd, isn't it? It's terrifying, but I don't know. Maybe I hallucinated it or something. Maybe I did dream it. Who knows? As an adult, I really don't know how to explain it, if I'm being honest. I'm open to possibilities, but deep inside of me, I still believe that it was real and that it did actually happen. This story is from 2019. I was 13 years old at the time, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. Maybe it's due to trauma. I don't know. I was bored at home alone. I FaceTimed my best friend, who lives in the apartment building next to mine and asked him if he would join me in a walk around the neighborhood. He wasn't there. He was on his way back home from school, which is understandable because it was a Thursday afternoon. But there is a jogging circuit near my house. It's like 500 meters away. But due to my massive boredom, I put on my sports clothes, a basic t-shirt, plus some shorts. But the shorts have no pockets, and this is an important detail. I then was headed with my music vibing to the circuit, Arriving there, it was surprisingly not that empty, around maybe 8 to 10 people in that 15 kilometer circuit. I started walking for a bit, then ran for a couple of kilometers and laid down in the grass. Now, I noticed two guys on a motorcycle going back and forth. I didn't care that much since I was sort of FaceTiming my two best friends anyway. It was getting pretty late. It was around 6 p.m. I guess and I was exhausted. I walked home, but I took another path that is kind of like a shortcut, I guess. I had to walk through an empty big street with buildings and construction. I took that same path many times before with no problems. But I had a feeling that someone was watching me and following me. So I turned around and noticed the same two guys on their motorcycle heading toward me. I sort of whispered to my friends on FaceTime that something weird is going to happen and that they have to cut their mics and focus with me. The guys came by and one of them asked me where the nearest barber shop was. Out of stress, I gave them a, a random location. While the rider of the bike asked about the barber shop, my right eye twitched and unfocused a bit. It always does this when I'm heavily stressed, but I was still able to see with it. I saw in the bike's rearview mirror that the other guy was trying to look at where my phone is. It was between my short and my belly because I had no pockets and I had my earphones on. I immediately freaked out though. Time was starting to slow down. Seconds felt like hours and I could no longer feel my legs. They went on but with a slow speed it was sort of like they were planning a backup plan or something. In any case, I had three options. There was a taxi guy fixing his car. I, I could have went to him and explained the situation, but my gut said, what if they noticed me and came back and maybe they do what they plan to do anyway. Two, I could stop at a random car and hop in with them and explain the situation. 
My gut said no, because what if the car was locked? Plus, the guys would have noticed that I knew what they were planning to do, and they would have come to me after the random car would go. Or three, and this is what I chose, run in the opposite direction into the traffic and take the path that I came by. I instinctively ran for a straight five minutes, eventually couldn't do it anymore, and I entered a field and started running again towards some slums. I looked back and... I saw the guys coming up after me into the field, and one of them was shouting, Just stop. Just stop. We, we just want to know where the barbershop is. There's this one thing about me, though, and it's that I always trust my gut. And it said, No, run as fast as you can, or you're about to die today. And that's what I did. I ran between the slums and kept running until I arrived near my best friend's house, who I was still in FaceTime with. I told him to come down the stairs right now and I laid down in the parking lot. He came and was freaked out because he knew that something was happening but didn't know what since I hadn't given him all the information yet. My face turned yellowish and I threw up. I, I couldn't feel my legs nor my arms anymore. He walked me into the house and I laid down and from that moment, to be honest, I, I don't remember much more. I just remember sort of waking up the following day with bruises on my legs due to me running into the field full of spikes and stuff. And that was it. The whole story happened in the space of maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And now, these days, I take that same path again with no worries. But man, I stayed off that path for quite some time after this. So I was adopted into my current family about five years ago, that being February of 2017. My family had a nice house where my siblings and I, we all had our own room. There was also a basement, which at the time was a game room for all of us and was the biggest room in the house. Eventually, my two older brothers moved out during the second year of me living there, and they did. My sister and I decided to switch rooms. I got her room and she got the basement room. During those two-ish years, my sister complained about numerous nightmares, I guess you could call them, and claimed to have seen dark shadows at night, as well as hearing the boiler room and storage room door open. Me and my parents would just sort of laugh at the claims and would say that it was because of how late she would stay up and all those energy drinks that she had. To be honest though, I really wish that I hadn't laughed. This past December of 2021, my sister moved out due to her graduating early and my parents renovated the basement room where I then moved into. I was genuinely excited to have my own space downstairs too. It was about the size of a, a smaller studio apartment I guess, with enough closet space and a bathroom with a walk-in shower and on my first night in the basement... It was so messy due to moving everything downstairs that I stayed up past midnight organizing everything, just wanting to get it done, basically. And, sure enough, I heard the basement door open. I thought that it was my mum at first, so I naturally joked around and said, Isn't it past your bedtime? I called this out. I opened the bedroom door, looked up the stairs to see the door was just wide open. I was kind of confused but shook it off and just closed it. I went back downstairs and closed the bedroom door. I eventually finished and went to bed. In the morning I asked my mum if she went down there during the night and she denied it. She claimed it was just me being tired so I shook it off. I didn't experience anything for a few days too. But then I came home from school one evening. I was home alone and came home to all of the basement doors open, as well as the door to the basement. We do have cats that weren't allowed downstairs, so I worried that they may have gotten into things. My mum never forgets to close the door too because of that, so I immediately thought that someone may have broken in. But our front and back doors were all locked still, and I had come in through the garage. I ran to check, and I saw our cat in the boiler room. She was in the far corner and I could hear her hissing at something. I swear on my biological parents too that that boiler room door 
swung closed. It's hard to shut too due to the wood door frame being somewhat uneven and that was what really confused me. Me, trying to be brave now, I went into the corner, grabbed my cat and I opened the door. I shut the remaining doors and went back upstairs where I found my mum just coming home. What are you doing with the cat? She asked me. Did you leave a bunch of doors open? I asked her. No, I haven't been home since like 8 o'clock and I haven't needed to go down there. Why? I told her about what happened and she mentioned how maybe my brother stopped by and pulled a prank on me or something. But neither of us could explain the door swinging closed. That night, I couldn't fall asleep too. I began to get all paranoid and started to overthink the situation from earlier. And then it hit me. I remembered the things that my sister complained about when she lived in the basement. The next morning, I brought it up to my mum and she looked somewhat concerned, I guess. She never believed in the paranormal stuff, but I did. I'm pretty sure that this convinced her, though. Then after this, it just kept happening. The boiler room door would open mostly, but from time to time, my bedroom door and the storage room door would open too. Lights going crazy on and off happened a few times as well. I had my one and only incident of sleep paralysis too, where I thought that I saw a tall shadow in the bathroom doorway. And it was around this time that I decided to ask for help. My friend's mum was a medium and I asked her if she could come to look and step into the basement to see. She agreed and came over one night. It was back in April. She said that she was drawn into the boiler room immediately too. She claimed that the energy was dark in the boiler room, specifically, and that there was some type of spirit and perhaps an entity that was trying to find peace and was just angry. She suggested that we get the house blessed by a professional, so my mum and I appreciated the help and she left. My parents, they knew the house's history too and we were all confused. To this day, now late May of 2022, these events still occur despite having the house blessed two times, but the activity has slowed down somewhat. I honestly believe that my sister's collectible antiques may have gotten attached to the house, but I'm not sure. She had a few creepy sort of like clown dolls and old frames for aesthetic purposes back in high school, but then again, those items aren't in our house anymore. I don't know. I'll take any tips if you have them, but thanks for listening. This happened to me during the summer of 2017. I'm a girl and I was 19 during the events. So I'm going to try and stay a bit vague regarding the details, like the country of happening, the origins of the people, the name of the places, because I don't want to be recognized or cause bad reputation to any community. Now, I was living in an apartment with my family. On the parking lot, there were always several guys repairing cars. I used to come back late home pretty often and see these guys just talking and sometimes saying to me good evening and one time I got as a joke, we kept you a spot, nothing inappropriate. I would always just answer politely and take it as a, a gesture of goodwill. I had noticed that one of them had tuned up a sedan and must be living in the same building as me but a different entrance because in the morning the car was parked there. It was really recognizable. One morning I was going to my work and I realized that this car is parked next to mine. And well, he doesn't live far so it's not that weird I guess. When I got into my car and I sat in there, I realized the owner is actually seated in his car and looking at me and sort of smiling at me. Well, okay, it's 8.30am, I mean, why not? I start to drive to get to my work and I'm in the special roundabout where you have to sort of stop inside if a car on the right is coming, which is the case, so I'm stopped there. I'm looking at the right to see when I can go and realize that in the second lane the car is there as soon as I take the road for work he's behind me even when we get real close he's still there 
I was working in a mall with the biggest hypermarket of the neighborhood, so I thought maybe he was just going for groceries or something. I get into the underground parking lot and I park and he does the same right next to me. I chose to ignore him and go for the escalator. And well, you can probably guess what happened. Yep, he does the same and starts to talk to me. Hey, uh, I'm Steve and you? Oh, uh, I'm Anna. How old are you? I'm 19. I'm 27. Is that a problem? Um, no. Why would it be? Oh, okay, so you work here? We arrived at the place where I worked. Yeah? Okay, well, I'll see you tonight then. Uh, bye. So at this moment, I realize that he's not really speaking the language well. I answered the questions because he didn't seem scary and, well, I didn't want to make a scene. When he said bye, I thought, yeah, I guess I will see him every night in my parking lot with his friends, so that's normal, right? But back when I finished work, the exact same thing that in the morning happened. While I sat in my car, I realized the guy was right next to me. Since I was surprised and he seemed really eager to talk to me, I got out and was like, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, I have something for you. Showing me a big smile. What? No. And he gave me a red rose. Embarrassed and a bit shocked. It was the first flower that someone had ever given me, by the way. I refused it a couple of times, but he kept on insisting. I knew the only way that I could get rid of him would be to accept it, which I did, and he left. I kept the flower in my car so my family didn't realize something is happening, and I threw it in a trash can outside later. So, this was the beginning of the week, and he started to wait for me after work to give me drinks, to ask me out for a cinema date. I actually said to this, but you don't speak the language well enough. You'll teach me, he said. Or sometimes he invited me to a restaurant. Obviously, I refused everything, but ended up accepting the drinks to make him leave. On the weekend, I had a second job as well. I had these late shifts in fast food. It was my first shift there since everything happened, and I was closing the restaurant with three other colleagues. Since it's pretty dark and late, there was a rule that one of us had to leave first and drive around the restaurant to make sure it was safe for everyone. I wouldn't do that normally, but this night I had a really weird feeling that he might be here. So I volunteered for the drive and, well, right on the spot, he was parked next to my car. It was one in the morning. And I mean, how long was he waiting there for? I told him to go a bit further, otherwise we can't leave, which he did. After my colleagues left, I stopped next to his car and opened the window, just to explain to him why I reacted like that. Not that I had to explain myself, but I thought that maybe he'd follow me until I explain. And before I knew it, he opened his car door and then got into my car. I just want to remind you that this man knew where I worked, where I lived, what my car looked like, and even who my family was. And it was a neighbor. That's why I never wanted to make a scene, I guess. But at this very moment, I was pretty scared for my life, I guess. A 27-year-old muscular guy that I didn't know was in my car at 1 in the morning in an empty parking lot. He seemed, I don't know, talkative, and I didn't have any other choice, so I decided to listen to him and learn stuff about him too. He said that he arrived in the country in 2014 at the capital, stayed there two years, and in 2017 he got in our neighborhood. I did the maths and realized that there was a, a whole year missing. I asked, and he answered, oh, uh, I was in jail. You can probably imagine just how scared I was upon hearing that. Why were you in jail? Well, I didn't have papers and I had a car accident. Okay, it wasn't that scary in the end, which reassured me. The guy said goodnight and he left. There were many times when I checked the inside mirror and would see that he was right behind me. I obviously wouldn't know every time that he was there, but... Even to this day, I, I check really often to see if a car is following me. Once, I was washing the dishes during a late shift. I 
had my phone and was texting friends, two guys, to let them know when I was finished and that we could meet. And well, I was working, so I had to leave my phone. And maybe half an hour later, a colleague comes to me and says, Hey, uh, your friend ordered at the drive-thru and asked for you. And uh, he said that he wanted to meet you later. I took my phone and said, So you came by? Were you alone? What are you talking about? At this moment, I rushed to my colleague and asked her to describe the guy in the car and, as you can guess, it was Steve. Now, I won't bore you with all the rest of the details, but there were so many cases of things like this happening. He followed me to my friends, threatened to reveal stuff about a friend to his dad that he knew. Also, one of his friends, Carl, who I spotted on my parking lot, had followed me a couple of times too. A friend who knew Carl was told that he was married, had kids and was like 40 and I was really shocked by that. One evening though, around 10pm maybe and it was already dark, I parked and saw a friend or a neighbour getting home. It had been a while so we talked a bit. He said that he'll be back in two so we can chat and while waiting I'm getting my stuff in the trunk. This is when the car parked behind me flashes its lights at me. I didn't have to turn around to guess who it was. I'd been patient since nothing too crazy had happened and I didn't want to scare or create problems for my family, but this night I was pretty angry and it was happening right next to my place. So I threw my stuff down and I rushed the car. Both Steve and Carl were there and I told them to leave, to stop following me. Steve didn't say a word and Carl just sort of smiled and said goodnight didn't answer and left well it must have worked because they didn't bother me for months steve changed his car and now had a black one which was still a really recognizable car he followed me a few more times and one day he even tried to talk with me with a friend that could translate well what he was saying i explained to his friend that i just wasn't interested and that it was the last time that i talked to him however Months later, I see in my neighborhood this kid that I knew from sports, and I knew that he lived in an apartment at about the same place as Steve. The whole thing was over, but it was always in the back of my head. I didn't really know who the guy was and didn't know if this would start again. I was curious though, and you know how curiosity is a bad thing, I guess. I started to talk to him. I was like, hey, do you know this guy, giving a physical trait, that lives in your building? Oh yeah, this guy. And he gives a description. No, no, the guy who owns the black car. Oh, you mean my dad? I froze. I have no idea how this conversation ended since it's still a huge shock even to this day. I know that I didn't tell him anything about his dad's behavior though. I knew this kid for so many years and he was actually the son of this guy. And... Apparently he had three or four brothers and sisters too. Then I realized that the guy had totally lied about his age because this kid was like 15 and I believed him like an idiot. But this is not the end of the stunning discoveries that I made. You see, a few days after, I meet a friend who knows about these events and tell her that the kid that she knows too is his son. She looked at me sort of shocked and she said, All this time it was this guy? What? You know him? He left his country because he stole money from powerful people and joined his family here but got into jail for suspicion of terrorism or something. And I mean, what the heck, right? And I remember that when he followed me, he would actually stop when I would arrive in the direction of the police station. I just thought it was because he still had issues with his papers or something. She kept talking and showed me a video. This is his wife here and the second woman is his second wife. She was apparently so tired of him talking to other girls that she went to their country to find a second wife for him. I want to be precise here and tell you that my friend had come from the same country as this guy, but she was born here. That's why she had this kind of information, I guess. Small community. It was a small community, so they kind of know it was a small community, so they kind of all know each other. So, 
In the end, I think that I was very lucky that nothing actually happened to me. I still find it hard to believe that it actually happened the way that it did. I wonder sometimes how it would have gone if I had acted differently. But that's a thought that I try to keep out of my head. Because dwelling on these things is pretty terrifying. So I moved to Canyon Lake, Texas in my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, but most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. And I never understood why until, well, the events started happening. You see, the house was finished in the summer going into my junior year. And when we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark though. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently that it sounded as if somebody knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinets and doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated drastically from here too. We would hear something in the woods just outside of the porch lights continually. First we thought it was a, an injured animal but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see unhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad was constantly hosting events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures or people in the house. But the worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming and... It sounded as if someone was walking up and down the stairs and going into every room, opening and closing the doors over and over again. I could honestly go on and on about the things that I saw in that house too. It was genuinely one of the scariest times in my life. I'm happy to answer any and all questions, but all in all, do not go to Canyon Lake, Texas. Texas.